Shalom, shalom, family. As always, at the 10 minute mark, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer. So, bow with me as we say the, the Lord's water, Prayer. To the moment you exit. Our Father in heaven, honored be thy name. May thy kingdom come. May thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us on a righteous path and guard us from the evil. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Shalom, family. If you have any questions today, fair use. As you know, we're going to get super deep today. And if you ever seen anything like this, let me just show it real fast. We're going to go to the root and solve it today. So first, let me show you what I'm talking about. I've seen a lot of people talk about this, so we're going to solve it today in its full entirety. Well, there goes Emperor. You guys heard an Emperor. I'm going to go to the timestamp where he talks about it. So right here. The full scale of Jewish revolt against Rome would escalate into the main portion of the war, lasting from 66 CE to 70 CE. And a Roman general named Titus Flavius Vespasian, all right? Titus Flavius Vespasian, I remember these people. He's one of the main characters in our, in our story in this series. What does he have to do with Christianity? Would be sent by Emperor Nero. Oh, Emperor Nero. There goes Emperor Nero. You guys heard of Emperor Nero, right? Getting assassinated. Okay. With somebody we're going to learn about too in this series. So obviously a historical error is him saying Nero was assassinated. It's clearly um, documented that Nero killed himself. But let's let's understand this. Keep on going. Look at that. My, my battery's always low on this. Let me go to the other point real fast over here while I grab that little chart. Roman. So there was Romans that, that was burning Christians. So Christianity wasn't just a Roman thing. It just became a Roman thing. Christianity wasn't always a Roman thing. It became a Roman thing. Now, the thing about Christianity, right, named after Christ, right, Christos, right, is obviously not going to be rooted to a Roman thing. It's going to be rooted to Christ and his teachings and the spreading of the disciples that had spread it and was willing to pay the consequences for those things. But obviously, right off the statement here, if you've seen this video or any other videos like this, there's a lot of videos that conclude that Christ is a conspiracy that came to light after 70 AD. So let's get a little history. Let's understand history first. The first thing to understand when it comes to these things is history. So fair use as always. I want to get into history first. First things first, let's get into history and understand what's going on here. So let me just start this off and get right into something on here. Let me just go right. Nero. All right. Nero, Nero let's talk about believing Nero. that he was a born actor, not an emperor, would later kill his own mother and then allegedly the apostles Peter and Paul. Then he again. Okay, so this took off really fast. I want you to see this. This is really fast. This is really fast. What did Nero do? Nero got into office, right? He killed his mother. Who else did he kill? Killed his own mother. And then allegedly... Just recorded who he killed. Let's, let's zoom, put this picture closer. If you remember, we just found this same image. Other, other, uh, other apostles and other disciples were noting Peter and Paul, who were historical, historical people, who is documented Nero killed both of them, right? Peter and Paul. That's very important. So remember, you see this image of Peter and Paul? Remember, we were talking about an image that we found, right? A first century or second century image, right? Of Peter and Paul, right? On this, on that other one, Paul was on this side and Peter was this, this side. Now Paul's on this side and Peter's here. So obviously it's one of those things in remembrance of these individuals who were martyred is documented historically, these individuals being martyred. So this is some very real images. Who you think is Peter and who you think is Paul in this one? This one's Peter and this one's Paul. You can see. All right, let's let's keep on going. Let's keep on, let's keep on keeping on, get a little, a little understanding. So let me just start it here. So let's get into the history before we start diving. Nero. Nero, believing that he was a born actor, not an emperor, would later kill his own mother, and then allegedly the apostles Peter and Paul. Then he again, allegedly, set fire to Rome, so as to read the verses on the fall of Troy during the blaze. He would accuse the first Christians of arson, and initiated their persecution. 
and finally, he took his own life. Most details of this era are known from Tacitus, a historian and senator who observed the degradation of Republican institutions. Fate of the Empire was now decided not so much by the Senate as by the Praetorian Guards, the Emperor's personal security force, created back in the times of Augustus. These suffocated Tiberius with a cushion, slayed Caligula by the sword, and hailed Claudius Emperor. In all fairness, at the same time, the empire grew, expanding into new territories. Roman legions conquered part of Britain, where they founded a town called Londinium. Provinces were given a transparent taxation system, and the non-Roman nobility began to enter the Senate en masse. A grandchild of an Italian peasant, Vespasian Flavius would become the founder of the next dynasty. Vespasian and Titus, suppressing the uprising in Judea, committed genocide against... Alright, so we're going to pause it. We're going to come back to this video. We're going to come right back to this video. Let's keep on talking a little bit about that fire of Rome. Let's keep on talking a little more history, get a little more depth into that history of the fire of Rome. So remember, Nero, right, was persecuting Christians, blamed the fire on the Christians, right? Very important. This fire is actually going to be our starting point. In Rome in 64 AD, a massive and devastating fire rips through the city. Three of the city's 14 regions are destroyed. Only four remain completely unscathed. It evidently takes six days to put the blaze out. The fire becomes a political nightmare for the emperor of the day, Nero. Public rumors begin to circulate that he actually started it himself. Because everyone knew he wanted to remodel the city, and now, conveniently, much of it has been leveled. Nero's response is, for me, another major turning point for Christianity. With fingers pointing at him, Nero needs a scapegoat. The Roman historian Tacitus, writing around 50 years later, claims the emperor singled out and blamed the Christians. In the next few years, according to Tacitus, Nero orders Christians to be crucified, burnt alive, and suffer all sorts of terrible punishments. Nero kills himself just four years after the Great Fire of Rome, and while his memory is actively wiped out by his imperial successors, and public buildings like the Colosseum are built over his private park, Nero's accusation against the Christians seems to linger in the Roman political and public consciousness. So very important history, Nero persecuting the Christians going on, right? Who's next? In space and Flavius, we're, we're going to get into the rise of these individuals. We got to work our way first. I'm going to leave that there, go down a little bit. All right, so very important. We're going to start throwing in a character during this time, they're going to be attacking Jerusalem. There's a character that's going to be introduced. We're going to talk about him, right? Led in chains before Vespasian, right? Remember, we were just talking about Vespasian, who now th this is important. We're going to talk about the family trees. We're going to talk about what is a Caesar and what is an emperor. Remember, Vespasian, the Flavian dynasty, became emperors. They were one of the few, of, I mean, they're one of the first emperors. That's very important. They became emperors, not Caesars, emperors. That's very important. Because if someone was to claim that they was to make a religion in their own image, one, they'll be going against the Caesar, which the Caesar, it's important to know that Rome also did a thing called Caesar worship, where they would actually worship the dead Caesar. The time of Domitian, though, we'll talk about Domitian, an emperor named Domitian, which is after these ones, he actually deifies himself while he lives. He actually deifies, makes himself a god while he lives. But these ones are actually worshiping the previous emperors. It's called emperor worship. It's very important. But already getting to start off, right? Led in chains before Vespasian, right? Because 
We're going to talk about Josephus and the story of him. Josephus assumed the role of a prophet, right? Josephus made, now the, the reason why Josephus was released, because he made a prophecy, right? And foretold that Vespasian, this is before Vespasian became an emperor, right? Now remember, his prophecy was that Vespasian wasn't just going to become the Caesar, but an emperor, which is under the Caesar. That's very important. He foretold that Vespasian would soon be an emperor, right? That's very important. He made a prophecy, talk about he would become emperor, right? Obviously, that, that, that came to pass after Nero's death, right? Remember, he killed himself. 68 AD, right? Now it's just now we're gonna have in space in. Remember the time of the four emperors, that's very important. A time of four emperors come up and they all basically fight for the throne. But in space in the six nine in 69 um, AD, that's when Vin space in was proclaimed, right? Emperor, right? He was proclaimed emperor by his troops, right? Josephus' prophecies came true. Now it's very important. We'll start getting into some of these things, right? Obviously. Um, he was happy. Vespasian obviously was happy with that. He released Josephus. His name wasn't Josephus at this time. It was actually Joseph, Joseph, and it was only Joseph, son of Matthew. It's very important. We'll get into some of those things and talk about some of those things. All right. It's very important. It's known as the year of the four emperors, right? In 69 AD, that's when it was finished, right? Um, it was a period in history of Rome of the Roman Empire in which four emperors ruled in succession, right? We're going to talk about all four of these and talk about what happened by, by 70 AD, right? All these things happened before Jerusalem fell. Let's 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 get an understanding on this history first before we proceed any forward. So we got to get a good understanding um, on this history before we proceed first. <laughs> The year is Anno 68, and Imperator Nero Claudius Divi Claudius Filius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, better known as Nero, is dead. Declared an enemy of the people and hunted down, Nero had taken his own life. The mad princeps had ruled the Roman Empire for 14 years and had died without an heir, leaving the way wide open for ambitious men to vie for the imperial throne. This was the world of 69 AD, commonly known as the year of the four emperors where four men did exactly that. The first usurper, the governor of Spain, Servius Sulpicius Galba, marched on Rome in late 68. The Senate declared Galba emperor, and the upstart general entered the capital. Galba made enemies almost immediately, and made the mistake of refusing the Praetorian Guard the donative he had promised them. And remember kids, always pay your bodyguards. Not long after, on January 15, Galba was murdered by the guard, which was promised the donative by Otho, companion of Galba. Before Galba's death, however, the legions in Germany had declared for Aulus Vitellius, whose troops were already moving towards Rome. Otho went to face these legions at Pagiricum and was defeated. Otho escaped the battle and committed suicide. In July, Vitellius had entered Rome and become the third emperor of the year. A challenge to Vitellius arose in the east in the form of the popular general Titus Flavius Vespasianus, known to history as Vespasian. Vespasian had been campaigning in Judea when news of Galba's death in the civil war in Italy reached him. According to the historian Suetonius, Vespasian heard a prophecy that the future ruler of the world would come from Judea. At this point, Vitellius's popularity that the future ruler of the world would come from Italy reached him. According to the historian Suetonius, Vespasian heard a prophecy that the future ruler of Pay attention. Who is he talking about? Where has Vespasian getting this prophecy from? Remember, this was a different historian. That's a different historian that's talking about this individual in the Flavian dynasty that's saying that he heard a prophecy from someone else. We haven't even talked about him yet besides this individual we just talked about who talked about a prophecy. But this is another witness who's witnessing who... This individual is receiving a prophecy. This is not writing from Flavius Josephus saying that I wrote a prophecy to him. This is someone else saying that Vespasian received a prophecy from someone else. So remember, we just looked at that. We're going to get into the history of these things. Let's keep going. The of the world would come from Judea. At this point, Vitellius' popularity had dried up, and legion after legion declared for Vespasian, known to history as Vespasian. Vespasian had been campaigning in Judea, when news of Galba's death in the civil war in Italy reached him. According to the historian Suetonius, Vespasian heard a prophecy that the future ruler of the world would come from Judea. 
At this point, Vitellius' popularity had dried up, and legion after legion declared for Vespasian. Antonius Primus, the commander of the Danubian legions, made open his support for Vespasian and marched on Rome, while Vespasian himself went to Egypt to cut off Rome's grain supply. The atmosphere in Rome was one of panic, and Vitellius tried to negotiate terms with Antonius' superior forces. The Praetorian Guard, however, had different plans and prevented Vitellius from negotiating. When the citizens of Rome resisted the Flavian army, furious fighting ensued, which caused much chaos and bloodshed in the city of Rome. In the chaos, Vitellius was dragged out into the street by a mob and killed. The Senate acknowledged Vespasian as emperor the next day. Sixty nine AD had begun with Galba on the throne and ended with this base. He had big ambitions, and according to Suetonius, he fought thirty battles and subjugated two powerful nations. After Britain, he was given the government. All right, so what did we just see from here? We just seen that Vespasian had received a prophecy early on that's very important. So he received a prophecy. Now, who is Vespasian? What is his family tree? It's, a, it's called the Flavian dynasty or the Flavian family tree. We'll talk about that family tree, right? It's not something that's a secret. It's a, it's a well-known family tree, a Roman family tree. It only had a short rule, though. It had a short dynasty, a very short dynasty. We're going to talk about that dynasty. It begins with the individual we're talking about, Vespasian, right? And we're going to talk about his children, the individuals that's connected to him with, like, Domitian and uh, obviously, Tacticus, we, and we're going to get on those things. So let's get a little understanding of this family tree. First, let me show you a video, and then we'll talk about this family tree real fast before we get into detail on these things. So we're gonna, let's look at the family tree. Of Actium. After that, Octavian became known as Augustus, and he is generally... All right, hold on. I hate when this... I don't know why this thing always pops on like that. I don't even know how you reconnect it back on to this thing. Let me close it and reopen it. <clears throat> All right, sorry about that. I don't know why that thing pops out like that sometimes. I think I, I click it and accidentally drag it, and it does that. I just don't like switching servers like that. All right, so let's let's get into this family tree. Let's get a little details into this family tree. I think I have a another tab open somewhere over here, um, but this is just we'll we'll get into this too. This just this is more de details of his son's life. We'll get into that. Where he would get well. court education. But let's let's get into this little family tree real fast. Let's get into this family tree. Let's do it. go down right here. All right. Let this play a little bit and let's get of Actium. After that, Octavian became known as Augustus, and he is generally considered to have been the first emperor of Rome. Okay, so first, first things he's showing, this is what's important, right? Everyone, when they think of Rome, they think that there's just one power ruling over Rome and everyone else just governors and whatnot. This is going to be your first group that's going to start off becoming emperors, right? This is different. Emperors are different than Caesars. That's very important. So here comes emperors. going to be emperors that's going to rule over, over this area of Rome. If we look to the side here, you can see some of the titles used by the emperors of Rome. Initially, the emperors were not technically monarchs. Instead, they held the title Princeps Civilatus, which meant first citizen or first among equals. In reality, though, they held as much power as a monarch would, if not more. But because of this title, the period we are about to look at is called the Principate. Now, Augustus did not have any sons, but he did have a daughter, and that daughter married the famous general Marcus Agrippa. And these two did have sons who were meant to become the heirs of Augustus, but they died young. And so Augustus named his two stepsons, Tiberius and Drusus, as his heirs. Tiberius and Drusus were the sons of his wife Livia through her first husband Claudius, and this is why the dynasty is called Julio-Claudian. 
Julio for the connection to Julius Caesar and Claudian for this link to Claudius. Drusus was actually the favorite of Augustus, but he died before Augustus, so when Augustus died, Tiberius was the only remaining heir, so he became the second emperor. Now, part of the agreement was that Tiberius would adopt Germanicus, son of Drusus, hence the line would eventually go through Drusus after all. Germanicus was meant to be the third emperor, but he died before Tiberius, and therefore his son Caligula became the next emperor. Caligula had a short reign and was assassinated, so the emperorship then went to the brother of Germanicus named Claudius. Claudius then adopted as his heir Nero, the grandson of Germanicus, and therefore Nero became the fifth and final emperor of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Okay, there's a secret family here that's not really talked about in de detail. You see this, the younger? We're going to, when we get to Peso, Piso, we're going to start talking about the younger, the, these lineage, these people. We're going to start talking about individuals, the younger, and things like that. We're going to start getting detail on who's um, Peso and what he has to do with Nero and certain things like that. We're going we're gonna to get in detail on these things. When we get closer to them, we're going to get detail on these things. But first, we'll get an understanding of the Flavian dynasty. Let's get an understanding of the Flavian dynasty. So you can see that all these early emperors were all connected through some sort of adoption, but also through some sort of blood relationship to either the Julian or the Claudian family. Now, Nero was quite famously thought to be involved in the Great Fire of Rome. He went mad in his later years and actually ended up committing suicide. So after his death, there was a power struggle. The year 69 is known as the Year of the Four Emperors, in which four different military leaders were proclaimed emperor. Eventually, Vespasian won out and became emperor for the next 10 years. He is the start of a new but rather short dynasty known as the Flavian dynasty. After he died, he was followed by his two sons, Titus and Domitian. Domitian ended up being assassinated, after which his advisor Nerva was proclaimed emperor. So with Nerva... All right, so let's, let's get in a little more detail. So you see these little family trees? It's a short family tree, right? It's a very short family tree. Now, what, what did you just see there, right? It's important to note... What we just seen, right, is actually a little more bigger. Vinspazin, right, this is going to be Vinspazin. He has his son, right, right here. It's going to be Titus, right? And then you're going to have, obviously, also his son, right? This one and this one, Domitian. So that's very important. So that's going to be the Flavian dynasty, right? Very important, right? You're going to have certain individuals right here. And we'll talk about... Um, their children and whatnot. And we're going to talk about these connections. Very important to understand just from what you're seeing here. You can see these names. We're going to we're going to come back and we're going to see these names when we start going to certain um, things as we get closer and closer to what what's going on here. Because that's a conspiracy that happened, and a lot of people they misunderstand that conspiracy um, and combine it with other things. Let me show you another piece on this. Actually, I think I, we already seen that. I'm going to leave this here. I'm going to leave that right there. And we're going to go down. So very important, the Flavian dynasty. The Flavian dynasty is a dynasty, right, that had all types of different things. For example, let's just talk about um, one of the things that happened there. Let's go. I'm going to go down and talk about one of the um, fairly interesting things that happened right here. All right. We're going to come back to this note. But first, let me show you something. Remember, Vinspazin's son, Titus, right? Very important. It's going to talk about his son, right? Titus then took a new wife of a more, obviously, a, a more, they say, a, a different family, whatnot. It's her name. It says, however, right, Maria's family was closely linked to the opposition to Nero, to Emperor Nero. All right? So, so basically saying he married someone who had basically um, a distaste from Nero. So that's very important. We're going to see that distaste, and we're going to see the evidence of that distaste, what happened there. Just says her uncle, right, this individual, and um, his daughter right here, 
were among, we're not going to talk about major of these. We're going to talk about the pinpoints of certain names. Those who were killed after the failed. Now, what is he saying? Who, who else died? There's other people who died in this failed conspiracy. It's called the Pesoian conspiracy. We're going to look at this conspiracy. You see this conspiracy here? We're going to come back to this conspiracy and we're going to see what's going on with this conspiracy. Let's, let's keep on diving though. Let's keep on diving. Go a little deeper into these things. So I'll get a little more understanding on the Flavian dynasty before we go up. A little more history on these individuals. After the death of Nero, Rome experienced a civil war for the time in a century. It was a bit complicated, so here's the gist. A general named Galba came from Spain and took over from Nero in June of 68. But he didn't pay the German legions, so they went into revolt under a general named Vitellius. Galba named some random guy as his successor, but another prominent noble named Otho was mad about this and bribed the Praetorian Guard, which killed Galba in January of 69 and made him the new emperor in Rome. In March, Vitellius's veteran German legions marched into Italy and destroyed Otho in some battles, making him commit suicide. After a few months, Vespasian came with legions from the east and defeated Vitellius, becoming emperor in December. This period is known as the Year of the Four Emperors because four emperors reigned within one year. After this chaos, things settled down quite a bit. Vespasian was an experienced general and proved fit to rule with stability and moderation. As a new man taking over from the collapse of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, he needed to establish legitimacy, and he did this primarily by giving gifts to the soldiers and the people, winning them over. Vespasian was also great with propaganda. During his reign, he was meticulous with crafting his public image. He commissioned historians to write favorably about him, portrayed himself as semi-divine on his coins, erased references to rebellious generals or political enemies, and punished those who spoke out against him. Because of this inherent bias in the source material, it is difficult to judge Vespasian's reign objectively, which is exactly what he intended. Vespasian commissioned several building projects in the city of Rome. The city was still damaged from the Great Fire a few years earlier, and he took personal initiative in rebuilding and improving still devastated sections of the city. He also fought against corruption in the law courts, helping to smooth the legal process in important cases. He sponsored campaigns in Britain, which pushed the borders of the empire into modern Scotland bringing the two orders closer together. Vespasian played a crucial role in expanding Titus was already excelling in public Titus was Vespasian's biological son. He had always been his father's trusted lieutenant. When the two fought against the great Jewish revolt in Judea during the 60s, Titus was the second in command and stayed in Judea when Vespasian marched to Italy. In Judea, he oversaw the sacking and final destruction of Jerusalem in 70, including the infamous destruction of the Second Temple and the diaspora of the Jews across Europe. In Judeo-Christian history, this is now seen as a great atrocity, but at the time, Titus and Vespasian won great praise and glory for their prosecution of this war, celebrating a triumph back in Rome. When Vespasian died, Titus was well suited to take over. He was a mature man of 40 years old and had experience in positions of power. He was hailed by the people, the senate, and the army. Optimism was in the air for Titus's long and healthy reign. Titus did everything right. He continued the policies of his father, presenting himself as the public face of the imperial regime and sponsoring public games. Worries about his immodesty or his reign. He experienced a quick onset of fever, weakness, and then swiftly died at 42 years old. This was a shock to everyone. He had no biological children, meaning the new emperor was to be his brother and serving as his father's right-hand man. Vespasian was hardly ever at home to take care of him throughout his childhood as he was off on military campaigns with so this is very important, right? So we're just getting an understanding of that these individuals have a life to them. They have a lot of um, information that can test to their life, and their lives are different. They And some of them don't even have any sons after them. Like, for example, right, like we just talked about with this one, he didn't have a son, right? He didn't have a son. He just was himself, right? Then Spazen obviously had a son. These are his sons and whatnot. 
But this individual right here, right, is very important to know that when we're talking about this Flavian family or this Flavius family, we got to know who takes over who and what's next. So let's look at the um, Domitian next. It's going to be the last one um, on this family tree that we're going to note. and making all the decisions himself. One can see how Domitian wanted to compensate for his marginalization earlier in life. Domitian, despite having little experience with administration of any sort, was remarkably competent and diligent. He oversaw every aspect of the imperial bureaucracy, cracking down on corruption and improving the reputation of Rome in the provinces. He also personally reviewed important legislation and refused to appoint family members or sell political positions as Vespasian and Titus had. His arrogance toward the Senate finally caught up with him. He would find out that he was no god. A courtier arranged a private meeting with him to show him a document. While Domitian was reading, let me, the courtier- Let me make sure I know. So obviously, Domitian, he later is slayed, is killed, right? They just shows that pretty much get killed. But what's important is a lot of these individuals, they deify their self. For example, um, I probably didn't show it, but when um, the first one, Vespasian, when Vespasian died, it's important to note what he says before he dies. He says he obviously shows his cockiness in himself. Vespasian died on the 24th of June, 79, after suffering an onset of bowel illness. He was 69 years old and had ruled Rome for nine years. Surrounded by his friends in the throes of death, he rose to his feet, stating that an emperor should die on his feet. Before he fainted, he muttered ironically, Oh dear, I think I'm becoming a god. So who is he uplifting? Anyone else? Is he lifting anyone else up? No, he's lifting up himself. That's very important. That's how emperors, um, Caesars, and in different individuals, that's how they get down. That's just what, what they do. That's what they do. Um, Titus ends up, when he takes Jerusalem, we're going to talk about what he builds um, for himself. Um, but let me show you a piece of an example real fast of something. All right. And all these things... Right, these are just faster uh, summaries of stuff. We can look at all the historical documents for these things as they're all contested. But this this is one of those things that is common is is not much to uh, debate on when you look at these uh, Flavian families. The historical documents, obviously, is, there's plenty of them. They were seen as separate. The stage was set for persecution. Now, for several decades, emperors had been deified, declared divine after they were died. In fact, one emperor, as he died, said, I think I'm becoming a god right now. Now, remember that son that Vespasian had imprisoned uh, back in in Rome? Nero took his son and said, I'm going to hold your son as a hostage. Well, that son, his name was Domitian. Now, in many ways, Domitian was overshadowed by his brother, Titus. Titus, who had taken the city of Jerusalem. Titus, who eventually became the Roman emperor. But Domitian became the emperor later on. Now, Domitian made a decision that he was going to be declared divine, not after he was dead, but in his own lifetime. One historian wrote this about it that was alive during this time. He said that he began as follows in issuing his circular letter in the name of his governors, our master and our God bids this be done. So he begins putting on his letters from his governors that he is master and God. Not only that, he he spreads this all over the Roman Empire. He makes sure that there's images of him all over the Roman Empire to the point that another historian from that time period said the whole world, as much as was under his control, was filled with images and statues constructed of both silver and gold. And an expectation arose uh, for people who were living in the Roman Empire. And the expectation was that everyone living in the Roman Empire would at some point offer at least a pinch of incense, at least a few drops of wine to the deity, the divinity of the emperor. Now, Christians can't do this. Christians can't do this at all. Because Christians know and believe and confess that the only divine king is Jesus. 
He's the only divine king. And he demonstrated this through his resurrection, that he is the sovereign king over all creation. And for them to offer even a tiny pinch of incense to Caesar would be to repudiate Jesus. Would be to... So did you know that, that the emperors were requiring people to do sacrifices before them, right? It was basically putting uh, sacrifices for individuals. I don't know what... Uh, <laughs> What this individual always put it as, but obviously you got to understand how it was at that time, right? The Caesars, they didn't care about deifying someone else. They wanted to deify themselves. In fact, many of them were so selfish, they would kill their own relatives, right? We see Nero kill his own mother, right? And we see individuals killing their own relatives, their own brothers, their own sons, mm -hmm. their own, because that's how they was getting down in that power, right? They were doing it by the sword. That's very important. They weren't deifying no one else, right? was no secret plot. It was, I want to be made powerful now. I want to be exalted right now. But Domitian, he's the one that did it a little different. He's the one that wanted to worship, wanted people to worship himself. They wanted, they, he, he actually did that in his lifetime. Other emperors or Caesars, they will be worshiped after they die. But this is the first time when an emperor would say, worship me. And he made images of himself, not of Christ. And he was persecuting people of Christ. For example, we did a video Right, we did a video on. I don't know why I didn't show this before, or maybe I did. I probably did it. Um, but we did a video. Let me show something real fast that I didn't go over. So let me show you something of the evidence of what Domitian did concerning John. Right, it's a book. You probably heard of it. It's called Martyr's Mirror. Let me just make sure I. Um, grab something from there, right? There's an individual that does a little read from it. Let me actually play Not it. Not used by the Christians, but it was an expression right that is linked to what was written on top here. of the cross of Jesus with the letters in re, which one. translate Jesus Nazarenus Rex Jurae. Jesus of Nazareth. Let me just make sure it's this one. Okay. What is up, people? Beefy here, and I hope you like my shirt, which I have on today. It is none other than yogi bear so come visit jellystone national park sometime when you get a chance this is my absolute history buff but i like to think that i am then you will definitely enjoy john the holy evangelist banished to the isle of patmos by emperor domitian a.d 97. John, the apostle and evangelist, was a son of Zebedee, and brother of James the Greater, he was born at Nazareth, and by occupation was a fisherman. Matt, for 21. He was called by Christ, when engaged with his father and brother in mending their nets for fishing. Verse 22. His glory, in the raising of the daughter of Jairus as well as in the showing forth of his majesty, when, on the holy mount, his Christ with all shall ye be baptized however, state that he was banished by Emperor Domitian, about A.D. 97, who... Alright, if you want to see this thing, I will put it in the description, but let me just read this part right here, right? It's going to be obviously, this is very important, if you never heard of Martyr's Mirror, it is a book with a bunch of historical quotes all comprised together. It just basically talks like this, this was afterwards fulfilled in him in manifold ways right just talks about some things that were recorded right it says that at rome he was put into a vat full of boiling oil just talks about how john was put into a, a bunch of oil right and obviously um the event was very miraculous and whatnot but it just basically talks about that at the end of the day domation right at the end of the day domation sent him to patmos right it's a big, it's a major read. It talks about basically how Emperor Domitian, right, in 97 AD was basically the one who was, and remember, we talked about how Domitian from Vespasian, his father, had got a paper of all the Judeans, all the sons of David from Messiah that Vespasian, right, historically documented, Vespasian had a record of all the sons of Judah, which remember, John was also of Judah. He had a list of all those things that Domitian got, and Domitian wanted to deify himself. That's very important. So very important. And he actually stressed that 
anyone who is basically preaching, right? Because they preach the word of God and confess Christ as son of God, right? So that's very imp important. That's why he sent them to that island. So very, very important. That's a prison island, the islands of Pathmos. So I'll put this in the description later. If you've never seen this little historical document on that. Before we get on to Vince Spazin and all those things, let's talk a little bit about the time of Nero. It was very important before we get to the time of Nero. There was a thing that happened in 70 AD, right, after Nero, which is very important to note. And it's going to be this thing. We'll talk about this thing, this arc, right? It's the arc of Titus, right? It's very important. We'll talk about it. We'll get into detail on those, to those things and whatnot and talk a little bit about those things and whatnot. Rome had Rome was... Rome was not spreading Christ. That's very important. Rome was doing the opposite of doing that. Rome was actually persecuting. Rome was persecuting the people for a long time, right? That's not what they were doing. They weren't spreading Christ. If anyone's trying to say that, they're in confusion and doesn't know history very well. They were actually persecuting individuals that were talking about Christ. That's very important. But let me show you something on Emperor Domitian. Let me show you something concerning Emperor Domitian. Let's go a little more history on Emperor Domitian. Why? Because all these stuff is going to come together when we start talking about uh, Piso and whatnot. Okay, so watch what it says here. So Emperor Domitian, very important. Um, just talks about the end of the first century. Um, obviously, these things we already went over. Just talks about Domitian's life and everything. It goes over simple things that we need to know. Obviously, after Vespasian's death, right, Titus became emperor and everything, right? And then came another one, right? Vespasian's other son, a man who was about to change the world, they say, right? Domitian, right? We talk about Domitian, right? What did he do? He entered into the, to the, to the powers. What did he want, right? He had a, a very important practice that he had um, for individuals. But this is one of the things he's mainly known for. The hardest hit were the Jews who were taxed for being able to practice their own faith. And by association, the Christians were tricked as well, right? Was treated as well, right? Treated. They were treated they had to pay a tax and everything because obviously the Dem nation had no he didn't want to do nothing um, with these individuals and whatnot. That's very important, right? That's these are things that are, are mo mainly known in history. It's not something that was um, surprising, right? In fact, let's learn a little something about Domitian. What did he do that's still known today? Domitian, Domitian, not satisfied with waiting for his subjects to deify him in death because that's how emperors were deified. When they died, they would make an emperor a god, right? That's why when Vespasian died, he, he said the words, I think I'm becoming a god, because he knew that people were going to worship him afterwards. But little did he know his son was going to change that, right? Decided instead to proclaim himself Lord and God. So this is very important, right? By his own name, right? While still very much alive this is very important so he start he changed the game so he started building idols and different things like that sent him across the kingdom and everything some of these things are still found to this day um the evidence of what he was doing he even made himself a place this is why he was persecuting the christians even more because he himself made himself a god that's very important in fact here's one of the historians if you never heard of this historian right this is one of the individuals that i didn't talk much on but we will you know, get into some of these individuals. I'll, I'll keep saying his name wrong, um, emphasis or something like that. But this is a historian, right? He's a historian. He writes later on about the events that had per happened um, early on um, before, right? He's going to be writing some things and he's going to basically be writing what had happened and what was recorded. He basically writes this, the teaching of our faith, right, glowed so brightly at the time that even writers alien to our belief, cited the persecutions and martyrdom in their history. So he just says, basically, the way, the things that Domitian was doing, because it's important, this individual is called a, he's a church historian. That's what he's called, a church historian. A church historian is recording history of the churches. He's a church historian. He's a little different than what you'll say, like apostles, stuff like that. He's a church historian, recording history of the church. And he's basically talking about, basically, the persecutions were so realistic and so major that people quoted them as a sense of basically um, letting people know what's going on, right? The real things in their history, right? It is during this time of intense persecution under Domitian that many people believe the book of Revelation was written, right? Very important. Irenaeus, right? Very important. He was a leader. He was one that was there during that time. He said something. He says, announced by him who beheld 
the apocalypse, obviously the revelation pretty much, because sometimes you'll see revelation basically said like a, apocalypse and stuff like that. It just says apocalyptic vision for that was seen no very long time since, right? But almost in our day, towards the end of Domitian's reign, right? Towards the end of Domitian's reign. So it's basically saying John, the book of John was seen um, at the end of, or revelation was seen at the end, about the end of Domitian. That's very important, right? Let us know that these things had happened and others was recording these things and knew that the book of Revelation was written um, early on and, and even said in the difference that the like Irenaeus, right, who was martyred, these individuals, right, had nothing to do with the other individuals. But Domitian was there and is contested by other uh, people witnessing that Domitian was there doing some um, crazy things. Just talks about Domitian's marriage and everything and just whatnot. And just talks about, you know, he made some very um, strange images and whatnot. Um, Domitian, obviously, he was one of the individuals that wanted to deify himself. No one else. He wanted to deify himself. That's just very important. Um, he was an individual that basically would be one of the last. Domitian's death, right, basically was the end of the, of the Flavian dynasty, right? Now, remember, this individual wanted to make himself an idol. But it's also contested that he hate, he did not like the Christians, right? It's very important that they were there and they were being persecuted by him. It's very important, right? It just talks about, obviously, a long reign and everything. It just goes over these things. So these are what you've been seeing here is these some um, little real images, obviously, contested of these things. The Roman history is one of the most documented histories um, of um, major, I would say, out of um, almost every empire, I would say. Um, but getting a little more information into these things, right? A little more information. Um, this one, I'm not going to play, I believe. I think this is just... Yeah, this the is collection just, at the British this is just Library information includes... about the oldest surviving New, Te New Testament and everything. Um, I actually have um, older um, things than that. But this is just some little information, just talking about that story and everything. Just making sure there was nothing over here I want to show. Just this little part with donation. Patmos is a small group. Now, where where was where was John? Where was he? Here's a, here's a final summary on where he was, right? After after that event. Island in the Aegean Sea, about 13 miles in size. It's a rocky volcanic island with a coastline shaped like a seahorse. The entire island is only about seven and a half miles long and six miles across at its widest point, with a current population of about 3,000 people. Patmos was settled by Greeks migrating from the mainland, probably sometime during the 8th century BC. The earliest known mention of the island is found in the writings of the 5th century Greek historian Thucydides. But just as frequent user of and believer in prophetic omens, and he was one of the few practices that would have certainly been denounced by the Apostle John. John's opposition to emperor worship, along with his continued preaching of the gospel, eventually reached the ear of Emperor Domitian, prompting him to take action. In the 14th year of the reign of Domitian, that is 94 AD, the elderly John the Apostle was banished here to the island of Patmos. All right, so very important. So that's that's something that's important to know, right? Domitian, right, being banished, right? Well, banishing John, which was tracking me, you can see. Talking about this, we're going to talk about this family tree. So Domitian was the last one, the Flavian family. So he was obviously persecuting the believers, right? That's very, very, very important to note. Very, very, very important that we note these things. Now, let's keep going. Let's keep on diving in this thing. Let's get a little understanding. So you see individuals, obviously, that's important to know. Emperor worship was something that was happening at that time. But Domitian, he ended up with his brother. After they took down Jerusalem, they built something, right? It's called the Ark of Titus, right? It's actually, it says it was actually constructed in 81 AD by Emperor Domitian, right? It's very important. So Domitian shortly after the death of his older brother. So he did it for appreciation of his brother. Um, he built a ark. Now, this ark is actually very important. A lot of people, they, they know about it. They, they know what's on it, right? 
It has some of the images of when they defeated Jerusalem, right? You'll see them carrying the menorah, right? That's very important. And look at the details of that thing. You can tell that they obviously was involved with the real menorah because that details, right? All the details here as they all had a menorah had to be made of one piece of gold and they had to have obviously seven candlesticks, right? Three on this side, three on that side in the middle. And they all had to be one piece, right? So that's very important. So they got to see in the Holy of Holies. No one got to see in the Holy of Holies. So for them to make this image, somebody looked inside that holy area and was in the area of the high priest, of the priest. So that's very important. So they, they end up going in there and taking this thing. Um, and we know they did because the images that they show. Just for them to be able to have that image just shows that they themselves got into that area and did some different things. But that's very important. It just talks about some things. I'm going to close this. Right? Just a little bit of that thing. Right? That's just very important um, to note. Just very important to note. I think we already went over this piece. We're going to start getting a little more. Yep, we did. Let's, let, we're going to start getting a little more uh, deeper now. A little more deeper. Right? So there's a... Now, the individual that I just showed you, I just showed you the Flavian dynasty. Right? This was the Flavian dynasty. That's what you're seeing there. The Flavian dynasty. There's a difference between, obviously, Titus Flavius, right? Uh, um, the individual called um, Flavius and the individual called basically Josephus. So there's a difference between Titus. Remember, we talked about Titus. He died, right? 81. But what's important, if he died in 81, obviously the individual that we're going to talk about, Titus Flavius Josephus, is different than Titus Flavius Vespasian. That's very important. Josephus, Titus Flavius Josephus, we'll talk about that. Now, what's important is you'll see someone with a pen name Flavius Josephus. That's not the same as Titus Flavius Josephus. His pen name isn't Titus Flavius Josephus. There's an individual with a pen name Flavius Josephus. We'll talk about that and who he's he, who he's linked with. Um, that's going to be a different connection. But remember, Titus Flavius Vespasian is a different individual. It says in this article, right? I'm going cl to click something here, and I'm going to show you something real fast because we're going to start getting on understandings of um, conspiracies and whatnot and different things. We're going to start understanding some things. This is actually a fairly interesting one. Um, history of religion, right? Just talks about more than meets the eye. Just talks about some things of Josephus' account of the triumph of Vespasian and Tacitus, right? Just getting a little understanding on these things. I'm going to read something that says, in this article, I focus on a literary account of the triumph, which, like the carving of the Ark of Tacitus, right, where we just looked at that, is an artful representation of the event, right? Jose Jos Josephus, the Jewish historian gives a, a description of the, obviously talks about those things in his book and whatnot. Uh, this lengthy, obviously a long lengthy of those things. He's just saying he's an eyewitness, right? To begin, let us separate the actual, now watch what he says here. Let us se separate the actual, right? Performance of the triumph of Vespasian, right? He's going to separate the triumph of Vespasian and Tacticus in Rome from Josephus's decade later, write up right this is very important because josephus actually writes after tacticus and vespasian dies and domitian dies after the flavian dynasty dies josephus actually writes these things it's very important but let's let's understand this of the events in the jewish war for the sake of this of obviously discussion let us continue to treat the triumph of vespasian and tacticus as a religion ritual um, just talk about some things, basically se separating them and everything, because he's basically doing a very deep examination um, on these things. He goes on to conclude, right? Ti he talks about then Titus Flavius Josephus, who told the prophecy, right? When we talked about that, other historians record that Flavius Josephus told the prophecy. This is an external um, source. An external source told us that. Flavius Josephus or Josephus, Joseph bin Maniahu made a prophecy to Vespasian, right? Very important. They became a prophet. Another um, external source to that, right? It says this. This is what, this is what we need to know about um, Joseph, his roots, right? And it's going to be from this little um, piece of information right here that I'm going to get this from, right? Watch what it says here. Joseph was born, Joseph bin Maniahu, right? Um, Joseph, bit of son of Matthew, right, into a priestly family in Jerusalem, right? 
as a young man, Joseph, right? Or Josephus, right? Because remember, Josephus is the Romanized name of jo- of Joseph, right? Joseph, or Josephus, was given a first-rate education and obviously getting, um, you know, growing up in the world, whatnot. He was also a leader in his community, right? That's very important. He was a leader in his community. In 640 um, AD or CE, only two years before the outbreak of the war, right, Josephus was sent to Rome to negotiate the successful release of a Jewish priest. That's very important. How do we know? Historical documents. Historical documents let us know Josephus was high ranking, right, very important. Returning home, he went home. That's very important. He didn't stay there. He went home. Josephus was caught up in the unrest that led to the surprising Jewish victory over soldiers of the Roman government. Governor, right? Talk about this one right here, right? Claudius, Gallius, right? What you see there? Jewish leaders in Jerusalem began to prepare for imminent Roman response, right? Obviously, that's very important, right? They basically put commanders and whatnot where they set them all up. And Josephus was what? Josephus was with other fighters. So Josephus was actually fighting with individuals, but got caught up because obviously he's fighting against Rome. And, Jer- and Jerusalem is very tiny. Rome is extremely huge. And, they, and they've been, they're war veterans. So, and, and Yah himself is very important. Why would Jerusalem fall? As, it, as anybody who knows prophecy, Jerusalem will not fall. Jerusalem cannot fall just because of manpower. You got to know prophecy. Why did it fall? Because the Messiah came there and they did not anoint him. That's the 70 weeks prophecy. It's very important. That's why Jerusalem fell. Otherwise, it would not fall. Look what happened to the Assyrians. The Most High sent an angel when the Assyrian came there and said, I'm going to take down Jerusalem. Right. Very important. That happened with Hezekiah. Right. When Isaiah was there. But we know that it fell because of the rebellion that happened at that time, right? Very important. They didn't anoint the most holy, right? But Josephus survived a mass suicide because he said they were on a basically uh, given passing lots. We'll talk about that in the details of it. Then when he was taken captive by the Romans, right? It's very important. Josephus, remember, we had an external source that com- told about this. Josephus, obviously, right? He had seeked audience with Vespasian, right? Here comes Josephus, meeting Vespasian, right? Remember Joseph? His name is Joseph at that time, meeting Vespasian. He predicted that general, right now he's a general, not a, yet an emperor, right? He's a general. General Vespasian, right, would soon be held as emperor. Very important. This is what he says. He says, you are master not only of me, Caesar, but of the land, the sea, and all the human race. See what's going on there. The prophecy was fulfilled, and a result, the personal circumstances of Josephus were improved. So very important. That's how Josephus got released, that he made a prophecy. And remember, we can see that others will contest to this. We can see it with Tacticus, with other individuals. Other individuals will talk about this a bit. Other individuals actually talk about that Josephus made a prophecy to Vespasian. He got released, and others basically um, allow themselves to become... You know, uh, well, others allow themselves to become witnesses to these things, right? So there's a little something. This is from J Pass, right? If you got J Pass, you can read a little more into it. What Tacticus says about it, things, what, whatnot. It's a real thing that happened, right? Josephus made a prophecy, right? Tacticus, put an S right there. Tacticus. So Tacticus made a prophecy. I mean, not Tacticus, but Josephus made a prophecy. Tacticus and many others recorded those things. Remember, we've seen that earlier, right? So. Obviously, um, Josephus has a, a piece in his um, writings here. This is what was really spoken, right? He just talks about some things. I'm not going to talk about it right now. It's an interesting read, right? He just talk about a few little things and whatnot. I'm just going to skip down, right? It's just some writings from Josephus and whatnot. It's going to be some writings. And even the person in um, 1737, the person that was translating the work of Josephus, his commentary is very interesting. Let me just read his commentary. The writings of Josephus did provide, basically, I'm just going to skip a little down right here. Um, right here. Right here. Josephus, on the other hand, provides the detail about how the high priest, along with the Sanhedrin, we talked about this before from other sources, when we talked about the Sanhedrin, right, took James to stone him to death in, six, in 62 AD. Remember, we talked about that, right? Under the circumstances that the obviously um, in parallel to 
Messiah, Yeshua, or Jesus, crucifixion, right? We say Jesus, but remember we broke that down, right? The S, this S was added on to make it masculine, right? When you change um, Greek with Greek names, they put an S at the end, right? Like Demetrius or things like this, Tiberius or things like that, Annas or things like that. These are going to be things that you'll see. You'll see at the end an S in it added on for Greek names. And remember, the J was originally an I, right? Remember, we talked about that, that J is only uh, recent, but it originally came from the I. That doesn't mean the sound wasn't there. It just means that the letter, the way that it was written nowadays to make it different is now here now, right? Just talk about some of those things, right? Go down a little bit. Now, let me just show you something here. This is very important, right? Just to get a little understanding. Josephus was a Pharisee. We're going to get into the history of that real fast and talk about what is a Pharisee. Let's go to that. I did a whole piece of history where we basically broke down that pretty much the whole biblical narrative Listen, is time. historically accounted for. But let's see a little bit of this little piece right here. ...to his brother Antigonus. But Antigonus was killed in a coup led by Aristobulus's wife, Salome Alexandra, who, after Aristobulus's death, married Aristobulus's younger brother, Alexander. However, Alexander was an unpopular tyrant who caused a civil war. And while he and his allied political party, the Sadducees, won that civil war, their victory was... There, you see that? There, look at the Sadducees. See what it's saying there? You seeing where some of these things are rising up from? Because you know, you, you read in the gospel, you get the Pharisees and you get the Sadducees. You want to find out when did the Pharisees come to part, and when did the, the when did the um, um, when did the, the the Pharisees and the Sadducees when did they come into existence? Right? Here's the idea. So you can see right here is is about a hundred years before the Messiah, right? Rapidly undone in a soft coup by Salome and her allies, the Pharisees, which ended up with Salome as the real power behind the throne. So you're saying there? Let's hear that one more time. Alexander. However, Alexander was an unpopular tyrant who caused a civil war. And while he and his allied political party, the Sadducees, won that civil war, their victory was rapidly undone in a soft coup by Salome and her allies, the Pharisees. Which All right, so this is, a, this is a very deep video, very, very deep. It goes to the roots of the Old Testament, New Testament. If you don't know who the Sadducees and the Pharisees here, I just put that there just to, for the sake of understanding who are the Sadducees and the Pharisees, right? Because we know that Josephus was actually a Pharisee. That's very important. We got other historical documents on those things and whatnot and talk about those things. His, this is just some um, under, understandings of the church and stuff. This is just some understandings of the church. I'm actually going to move this to a different place right here. This is just a, a little understanding. Let me actually move it. Because now we're gonna now we're going to get a little more detailed into um, more of the history of these things. Let me just put this somewhere down here. All right, there we go. All right, let's get back to that history. So remember, we're we're still working our way to get to the other individual to get about these conspiracies. But first, we got to get an understanding of who these historical people are by their historical um, accounts. So very important to know about these historical accounts before we move forward, before we move forward, right? All right, so just show a little bit of that. Now let's now let's start talking about some very interesting things um, concerning um, different individuals like um, Arianus, uh, basically, how you say that, Peso, Peso, this is actually very important. It says his pen name was Flavius Joseph, right? Or uh, Josephus, right? Flavius Josephus. But important to know, remember, his name isn't just Flavius Josephus. It's Titus Flavius Josephus, right? He received from his spades in the, the name of his son, Titus Flavius Josephus. Not just Flavius Josephus, because Josephus, Joseph, is a famous name. Right. And we're going to talk about this individual. We can find out who this individual is and we're going to connect it with these things. We already talked about different things. Right. We talked about this. Right. That's a, there's some claims. Let me just show you some of the claims and whatnot. There's some claims that's made that says that this person. Right. They say that this person is Titus Flavius Josephus. But this says Flavius Josephus. That's not Titus. That's not the same Josephus. 
we know because it doesn't just it doesn't just it doesn't just go by the way someone wants to make it. You don't just put Flavius Josephus and say, there it is. Is it Titus Flavius Josephus? No, it's not Titus Flavius Josephus. It's very important. In fact, this book is um, from the 90s. The person who wrote this book was from, is from the 90s. And you can tell it's in confusion because he goes on and he starts to talk about Islam. Starts to talk about the connection with Islam and stuff like that. And it gets really um, nonsensical, right? It goes on and talk about Islam and talks about those things. The person obviously doesn't know what they're talking about. It's one of those, in fact, it's been rebuked multiple times, but we're not going to go into it right now. This little book by name. But let's 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 go further into this this understanding of who this individual is, right? That was that book was written in 1979, just to get a little understanding on there. But this book is an error. As for example, here's an example. How we know this this little book is an error. So this book right here, right? Obviously having wicked connections and everything. What's important about this book, let me just go up a little bit. It just talks about basically it talks about this. It talks about inner circles and inner circles, right? It just talks about they have a conspiracy, a great secret. Hmm, great secret. All right. That obviously the Cap Capralinius um, Piso family of ancient Rome, they say created Jesus. Now they say fictional Jesus. Obviously. We already confirmed Messiah as a historical figure, right? Any any historian, any logical historian looking at history can contest that Messiah and his teachings are existing things that exist. Otherwise, who would Nero be blaming, right? Obviously, that's important. But remember, we're going to note who this person is, the, the Piso family. What is his family, right? What's, what's going on here with these things or not? But it's just talking about some things and whatnot, coming to some conclusions, right? Got some ideas of it, right? He has some ideas of some stuff, but we're going to go into depth onto these ideas, right? Like I said, it's just a, basically a, someone who's confused and mixing all types of things together. Doesn't really know history um, that well. But what's important is a lot of this connects with the Q theory. Have you ever heard of the Q theory? This is, what, this is basically what the Q theory. If you don't know the name of it, you're going to fill it in with all types of stuff. You can fill it in with any name. But it's called the Q religions. Theory. Let right? me show you. Let me show you what it is when people start talking about it. I'm gonna go to something on here and start talking about this. Write it ourselves. About the year 60 AD, Lucius Calpurnius Piso composed Ur Marcus, the first version of the Gospel of Mark. All right, we're gonna look into this again. Ur Marcus. Ur Marcus, the first version of the Gospel of Mark, which no longer exists. He was encouraged by his friend Seneca. Now, now, what was the most important? What was the most important thing about this evidence? The word here, which no longer exists. If something no longer exists, you can just all, all no matter what, you can just make all types of conclusions all types of errors. I'm going to leave it right here because we're going to come back here and talk about some of these names. Certain names like who you see right here, right? Lucas Cal Calpurnius P Piso, right? We're going to talk about this individual and we're going to talk about other individuals that's going to be um, talked about and whatnot. We're going to get back to this. But let's leave that here. Leave that there. Let me close some of these. All right? So what is it? What is actually going on? What do you talk about the, the mark that... Um, this Ur Marcus. Let me show you something. Have you ever heard of the have you ever heard of the two theory? There's a two source theory, right? Here's what here's basically what how it goes. Long story short, this is how it goes. Supposedly, this is and this is how it goes. And and what is basically is, is a twist of this theory. They believe that Mark wrote Matthew and Luke, right? But they also believe that Q, someone else, wrote Matthew and Luke. That's very important. Um now, what's important is it'll talk about basically these gospels draw their source from the gospel of Mark. But the thing, the interesting thing about the gospel of Mark and these in individuals, they, they're they mixing a conclusion that Mark, because Mark was known as being an oral tradition, that it was, it was, it was actually a different individual that wrote Mark. Basically, is basically saying the gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark are based on a God. I mean, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Matthew, and the Gospel of Luke are based on the Gospel of Mark, right? And it's basically saying it's basically um, from oral tradition, right? Very important. It's one of those things that people know about. It's one of those things that people were talking about. We're going to talk about it, and we'll talk about what was the conclusion 
of this thing. This was something early in the 90s, 80s. They were talking about it. Scholars came together and they was trying to figure out what's going on with that. We're going to get into detail onto these things, right? That's what he's reading there, right? It's going to be a very important conclusion um, that we're going to talk about real fast. All right, here's another piece. It's, it's called the Q debate, right? Since 1955, right? Q is the remains. You ever heard people say Q, right? That's This is where they're getting it from. It's get, they're getting it from this deep understanding of Q, right? An individual who they believe it must be someone who basically was um, part of writing that thing, right? Just basically, and basically this is what's important. It just talks about how, you know, it was one of those things that eventually abandoning the um the basically the, the Ur Marcus theory in favor of Matthew's and Luke knowledge of canal. Obviously, they already obviously knew Matthew. The book of Matthew and Luke obviously knew Mark was canonized. That's what ma- that's what makes the theory. That's what makes it wrong to try to make. And we're gonna get a little more deeper. That's what makes it wrong to try to make the idea that Mark right was not um, inspired when Luke and all and those individuals show that it was inspired. It's basically, this is what they come to in conclusion here. When they're looking at the Matthew and Mark in comparison, they know that it's actually coming together. Here's just a summary of the end result. Here's a summary. Those are just notes for reading all of it. Here's just a summary of the end result. Ur Marcus, right? Very important. This is the name given to a proposed earlier edition of, proposed, because there's not no evidence of it, earlier edition of Mark's gospel. Which was, which was later right edited into the form of the existing existing text. Guess what? It lacks obviously support. It it, it it lacks scholarly support, right? In as a favor is out of favor. As a theory is out of favor. Scholars don't go by that because they know that it's not. We don't just have Luke and Matthew to verify it. We have multiple multiple, and I'm saying multiple different first century or even in the sense other um, individuals that were recording not just the, the events of Mark, but the events in itself, right? Messiah is historically documented. He's, we understand that who he is by his disciple, right? We already seen him, Jacob, right? His disciple, Jacob, right? Which is a disciple that's not known to Christian um, sources, right? Or Christian... Uh, no, it's not really known by a lot of Christians, but it's known because of the Jewish sources, right? Very important. This little book, just for the clarity, and anyone who looks into it knows that that is a dead trail at the start. Just to even suggest it shows that they're not looking into that two source idea, that they already concluded that it was not what it was. That's very important. Now, let's get a little more deeper. Now, let's understand there's a conspiracy that's known. Right. Peso, we're going to look into who I'm showing you here is going to be someone that's going to be connected to this individual. But what's important about it, remember, we talked about a conspiracy earlier, the Pisanian conspiracy. We were just talking about that a little earlier when we talk about the Pisanian conspiracy with the Flavian dynasty. Remember, we were talking about that with the Flavian dynasty and what they had did. Right. Very important. This is going to be very important. Remember, we talked about this. Right. Where did we talk about it? Right here, right? We talked about the Pisanian conspiracy. That's why we was looking at the Flavian dynasty because it's going to be connected to the Peso conspiracy. We're going to get into this. It's going to get very close and pinpoint to all these things. Again, to a little understanding on these things. So he's a conspirator, right? He was made a conspiracy. This individual had made a conspiracy. It's very important to note against Nero. So we're going to note this conspiracy that had happened and the details of it and what had happened with that. It's going to be very important. It's going to even, when the conspiracy was broken, it revealed a family tree. And we're going to talk about it, how it broke open a family tree. We're going to get a little understanding on that. Um, I'm going to um, read something here, right? I'm just going to play this Claudius. I'm going to look at something. Who's Claudius, right? Who's Claudius? Before we start getting in this, let's get back. We're going a little back now. This is just important. Italians... Where, where are we going? How, how far are we going back? We're going back to the time of Nero, right? Claudius, we go to 17. Over here, let's get a little understanding on these characters real fast. Very important characters to get a little understanding of, right? Remember Nero, right? We're going to get some very important characters to talk about. You see this one? Let me just play this to get a little understanding. Through Caligula, 
That was a feat, I'm sure. Yes, through Claudius, <laughs> through the Emperor Claudius. In other words, um, except for Caesar and Augustus, through the entire Julian um, dynasty, uh, including Nero. It was under Nero that the war broke out. Then there was the year of the three emperors, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius. And, of course, Vespasian, who was one of his patrons, who was the you general. Remember that war? Your... You know, Vespasian, you know what happened with that? But let's get back to Catrilla. If you've never seen his little video, this is just a, a little lecture that talks about these individuals that basically goes into the depth of them and everything. But here's who we're talking about. Note the year 4153 AD, right? Very important, right? Just talks about what he's talking about here. He, he has a, a memory, right? This individual, right? Claudius recalled Piso in Rome probably soon after his accusation in 41 AD, in, in AD 41, right? It's very important. Who we're talking about? We're talking about this individual, right? This is not who we want to, this is not the individual we want to see yet. We want to, we're going to get closer to the Peso we want to find. But this is going to be leading us to that peso, right? Just talks about some things and whatnot. Peso then became a powerful senator and everything, right? And then he had what? He stayed a senator for a while, right? Under the emperor Nero, right? And then watch what happened here. And in 65 AD, so this is very important. Watch what happens in 65 AD. Led a secret, right? This is very important idea to replace Emperor Nero. So that conspiracy was the conspiracy to replace Nero that became known as the Paisanian conspiracy. This is very important. So the obviously they had a leverage right now. So what's going on? What what is what is the connection with this Piso and his ability to try to replace this Nero who is an emperor? We're going to talk about that. We're going to get into this. It was a, a lot, a couple different people in it that we're going to see what happened there. Obviously, what happened, right? We're going to get into this area, right? It says, by AD 55, the city was endured. Obviously, remember the fire of Rome? I remember, obviously, what happened? we seen that Nero blamed the Christians, right? Very important. And then what happened? Under the leadership of Piso, right? It's saying Piso was involved with persecuting the Christians. It's saying under the leadership of Piso with the goal of killing Nero, right? Very important. Spurring groups of conspirators to come together under the leadership of Piso, right? With the goal of killing Nero. It's very important. Very, very, very important, right? Very, 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 very important. Because other people was joining in to take part in this thing, but it broke. We'll talk about how it bro broke and everything. But let's go a little more, let's go a little more deeper into it. Just talks about that plot and everything. Just go into a little more depth onto the plot and everything. It says, talks about Peso. Peso was survived by his son, right? This is very important. Just talks about this invert in person right here, right? Let me just click it here and show you something here. Because we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna look at, we're gonna find their family tree. Is what we're gonna find, and we're gonna see who these individuals are. I shock you some connections here with some of these things. So just talking about basically, um, basically this individual here, just to get a little um, understanding on it. I think this one would have not 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 this one, not this one. This one, this one's okay. This one's this one's fine. It's a little idea, but it's not really um, giving us detail. But it's letting us know. Basically, note what you're seeing here. This individual. This is a son. This individual is a son of who we were just talking about, Piso, the one who made the conspiracy, right? But notice his half brother is is this person. This is who we want to find here. You see this person right here? This is a real. This is another person, a different person. We're gonna note who this individual is, and we're gonna get an idea on this person. It's gonna get a, a very important understanding. We'll leave this here. We're gonna leave this here, and we'll come back to that, right? We're gonna we'll come back to it. We're gonna leave it there. So you see what's going on there. Just talk about, right, this person, marry this person, and just talks about, remember that person from this video, this video right here? Remember it said about, he said supposedly this person wrote that in 60 AD, this person right here, you see that's name, Lucius uh, Cal Calpurnius Piso, right? You see what's going on there? Lucius Calpurnian Piso, just talk about that, daughter of this person who survived one of the individuals. We'll talk about all these people, how to connect it. We're going to get into that. 
obviously remember what we've seen. Nero blamed the Christians, right? That's very important. We already know about that. Recorded by Tacticus and other individuals that record these things. We already talked about that. This just talks about Tacticus and the Christians and what happened, right? He just says Rome was destroyed by a great fire, right? And just talks about Nero was blamed by basically the Romans, obviously blamed him, but he turned to the Christians. He turned to blame the Christians and whatnot and all those things, right? Very important what happened there, right? It goes into the information of those things. But let's let's keep on going. Let's keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. Let me go down. So obviously, if you want to see the full report on Nero's suicide and all those things, a little information here. But I'm going to skip this one. This just goes into some of those things and talks about um, some of those writings. There's a lot of there's a lot of information in these things. There's a lot of historical writings. But for time's sake, as you see, uh, we're just kind of going through these things and whatnot, but they talk about it, right? Talks about the lives of the 12 emperors, go into details of their lives and whatnot, go into who they are and, and different things like Nero and stuff like that. We'll close this. So that's just a little information, right? It talks about the death of Nero, very important. He kills himself pretty much, long story short, is highly documented. No, it's even, you can even hear about it, right? You can hear the actual, this is a writing, Right. If you've never seen this, the lives of the 12 Caesars is from 75 to 160 AD. It goes into pretty much the history of all these emperors. You can see the, the history of Vespasian. You can see Titus, Domitian, Nero. Um, it's very highly, highly understood that these were real individuals of their doing their own things. Um, very important. So I'm not going to I'm going to play it right now. But that's something that's there just to get a little more details into some of the historical things. Just so you see that though we're playing this thing to understand that, you know, to get an understanding that what we're showing is actually um, history. Here's a here's a little piece. Let me just show this part 1830. Because remember, we were talking about um, Claudius, right? Right. All these names seem like a lot of names because there's a lot of names. Influenced. Because it's a major conspiracy. But let's let's keep on going. To accuse him of embezzling funds which led to the dismissal of the emperor's trusted advisor from court. Despite Claudius's old age and declining health, the emperor continued to rule up to the year 54 AD, when his son Britannicus was about to take the toga of manhood. According to ancient historians, Claudius was then murdered by the convicted prisoner Locusta under the orders of Agrippina, dying in the early hours of October 13th although there's no real proof that he was poisoned. What is certain is that Claudius's death secured the ascension of Nero to the throne. Britannicus, meanwhile, would be poisoned a couple of months after his father's demise, allegedly under the orders of Agrippina and Nero. Claudius ruled for 13 years and 9 months, accomplishing many things in his reign. Despite Claudius's deification following his death, Nero would severely criticize him and his policies, accusing the former emperor of being a tyrannical usurper. Well, how ironic that uh, Nero calls him tyrannical when he himself was doing worse. He's known as one of the worst emperors. Let me close this and reopen it real fast. All right, all right. Just opening up the screen again. All right. So now let's let's get a little more. Let's get a little more deeper into it. So that's why we was looking at Claudius, right? A little information in those things. Close this. All right. So let's let's keep on keeping on. So this is just gonna be this part is just important to note the historicity of the believers in the land. I'm just gonna skip this part. It's gonna skip these parts here. Right. There's just some other things going to some things, but let's get into Remember, We were just talking about this person, Lucas. Right. We're going to get into some things. Right. We're going to get into some things and whatnot. But before I do that, let's get some um, understanding of some things real fast. Let me just show you something. Take two. Last time I only got to five minutes. Here we go. I have an objection to. 
25. This would require that the Romans get hundreds of Jewish people, or Palestine region, excuse me, and this was proposed originally, now this is as far back as I can trace it. I'm, I'm sure it goes back further. 1877, Bruno Bauer. And then a hundred, over 100 years later, 1990, excuse me, 1979, Al, Abelard Ruchlin added in the a person named Arius Calpurnus Piso. This was then repeated and or modified by James Balitinhani, I can't get the names right, and J. Gallius. And then we hit the internet age. A Usenet troll who was known as Roman Piso, because he wanted to have that as his name, made these assertions, uh, but it was really a person apparently named John Duran. I don't know if that's true. I'm not double-checking any of this. I'm just bringing you the story so far. And then Joseph Atwell based his assertions on what I call um, blender scrabble and such. Uh, it's when you take a Bible or any other book and just scramble up the letters and then try to find words in it and then say, see, I proved my point, and then ignore everything that doesn't support your belief system. This is sometimes called Babel, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Bible code. Or uh... I don't even know why I put this here, but this is just some information. This is someone who talks about basically, you know, if you take the historical accounts and take into account this individual, stuff don't add up, pretty much what he's saying here. That stuff don't add up, pretty much what it comes to the conclusion of. Um, but let's get an understanding. Let's get an understanding on these things, right? Let's get an understanding on these things. So history is clear. So let's let's see who this um this individual is. Let's get a little more detail and we're gonna look, we're gonna find out what's going on with the conspiracy, with that conspiracy. So obviously Lucas uh Calparinius Piso obviously died. When did he die? 70 AD. We're going to get into these things and whatnot and whatnot. Um, very important. So this individual, he died 70 AD. That's just important to note, right? It just talks about what happened, right? Here comes Piso the Younger. Maybe I'll tell you about the Younger. Maybe I'll tell you about people, the Younger. We're going to start seeing some family trees and we're going to start seeing these, the Youngers, right? Just talks about Piso was the son of, right? Talk about a Piso, the son of this individual who died, right? We talked about that, right? This is another person, right? This is a different person. This individual, right? We're going to talk about these ones and whatnot, right? It says Piso was the son of Lucas Caparinius uh, Piso, who had been forced to change, obviously, a couple of different things, change his name from this, right? At first, his name was this. That's very important. This was a different person. The person that I just showed you up here, this is the son of him. This person actually died in AD 20, right? He had another father who, was, who had the exact name that changed, right? At first, his name was this. Then it changed to Lucas. Then his son had the same name, right? To Lucas due to his father involvement. Why? Why did he get had to change his name, right? Why? Because Lucas due to his father's involvement in a conspiracy against Tiberius. Wait a second. Another conspiracy? Because their family has a lot of conspiracies going on. We'll talk about that. The different conspiracies that a family be having going on. So they be having different conspiracies, one with Tiberius. Now, this was earlier, AD 37. So he, he had to change his name because of a different conspiracy. Because that's how Rome gets down. They're full of conspiracies. Um, and it's usually com concerning swords and, and shields. When I say swords and shields, trying to save your life and trying to kill somebody. The life of the younger Piso is not well known prior to his, obviously, talk about his, his consolation or consul in 57 as, obviously, right? He basically got connected with, with Nero, right? Basically, one of the, the Pisos had connections with Nero, right? That's very important. We'll start seeing some of those things, what's going on, how did he get involved with him, and what happened. Obviously, this individual we talked about, he died, right? Talks about what happened, right? It says Piso was not moved by this news. Just talks about some things. I'm just going to skip to the bottom where it talks about what happened, right? Basically, just talks about, let me see, where is it? Um, right here, Piso avoided showing himself to the crowd. Just talks about some things when what happened, right? Basically, just to make it simple, you know, obviously war. You know how it goes, right? War was going down and everything, right? It just talks about basically they were in Africa, North Africa, right? Pretty much, and then Piso basically re re refused to leave his palace and whatnot. Um, obviously, what happened? Piso avoided showing himself to the crowd, but managed to have the messengers brought to him 
on questioning him found that basically um, an individual was in, dispatched to kill him, right? To talk about someone who came to kill him. But basically, a long story short, um, he died, right? It just talks about basically from Tacticus described as a man, even then fatal to the good, right? Destin and all these things on this course and everything, basically, he comes to his, his end. And remember, that was 70 AD when he had died, when this individual had died in 70 AD. Long story short, doesn't get understand. He was serving Nero, under Nero. But he continued on and, you know, didn't make it to the next course of his life, right? Under Vespasian. He didn't, he didn't continue on. But he did, it says right here, after... After the death of this person, he was killed by supporters of Vespasian. So very important. So Vespasian got in office, this individual died. That's very important. So Vespasian and this individual are, are not connected. We're going to see his brother. Remember, he had a brother. Remember we were talking about that? He has a half brother that's going to be important to the note. And we're going to talk about that brother, right? Let me just make sure we are seeing it right here. Real fast, right? We talk about the individual getting his name changed and whatnot. But we're going to talk about another individual. I'm just going to leave that there and continue on, right? This individual, right? Remember we talked about the father of that of this individual who he's talking about here in 60 AD? Remember his father died in 20 AD. So this is going to be his father, right? 20 AD, right? This is going to be that individual. Now, let's see a little bit about his father. What happened with this, this individual? Remember that conspiracy he was talking about? He had a conspiracy. That's a different conspiracy, right, that had happened. We And I'm just going to show a quick little thing of it. We already talked a little bit about it, right? This is a, this is another conspiracy. We talked about how the, these individuals be having different conspiracies. They don't be going well, but they be having those conspiracies. They be, they be happening. So a lot of, and this happens a lot in Rome, right? Now, what's important to understand, right, it just lets us know. Let me just read right here. Um, just talks about who he's a member of. It says his father and grandfather both shared his name, right? His father and grandfather shared the same name, exact same name. With his father being, remember, this name changed, right? That name, Ganas, Ganus, that whatnot, right? That name changed and whatnot. His grandfather being obviously in the conspiracy or not, he had a brother, right? This individual, right? Um, obviously, getting a little understanding. We're just talking about a couple of different things, getting a little understanding of their family. We're going to come back to this. We're going to come back to this individual. Um, maybe we might come back to this one, but we have another individual who we're going to come back to. Just to keep this here. I'll keep that right there. Right? So you're getting a lot of different, a little bit of different names here, right? Just to get a little understanding. Piso was the son of this individual, Lucas uh, Calperit. Calperness. I keep getting these words all twisted. Um, Piso, remember, like we said, his father, his father, and his father had the same name. Just all of them had the same name. Who had been forced to change, obviously change his name, whatnot, whatnot. Right? We talked about that. Let's keep on going. Right? We talked a little bit about these individuals. Right? They're all source. They got um, information to. Right? They're not just going to be random stuff, but they're going to be things that's cited. Right? Connected to other sources, right? You can get the sources for those things. Just put the sources there so you can see where it roots to. But now let's get a little information of this peso. Here's a quick summary. Here's a quick summary of what we're going to break down real fast. This is, it's going to get deeper. We're going to break it down deeper, but here's a summary. Other people know about this, but let me just give you a summary just so you can get a clear, direct answer of this. Yes. We'll show you real quick that a man named Arius Calpurnius Piso was not involved at all in the conquering of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Uh, that battle, he was not a general. The generals who were leading that campaign were Titus and a man named Tiberius Julius Alexander, if I'm correct. And those two, Titus being first in command and Alexander being second in command, conquered Jerusalem under the um, orders of Caesar in Rome. And so if you go back and you do the research on the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, there's not any mention at all whatsoever of an Arius Calpurnius Piso. It just doesn't exist. The guy's name doesn't exist. And if you dig deeper, you will find that in no Latin or Greek text, manuscript, codex, scroll, papyrus, anything, is the name Arius Calpurnius Piso. It doesn't exist. There, were, there was a family in Rome, some aristocrats named Piso, but Arius Calpurnius Piso is not in any manuscript of antiquity at all. It doesn't exist. In fact, there have been quotes from scholars who have been presented this information saying, hey, have you ever heard of this Arius Calpurnius Piso? And they're like, no, 
this guy doesn't exist. He does, there is no evidence whatsoever that this ever, this, that a man named Arius Calpurnius Piso ever walked the face of the earth. Just doesn't exist. So where does the theory come from? Well, it seems like uh, from people who have researched this online, and you can do your own research, that this whole theory, whole fraud, uh, appeared starting started to appear in the 1980s when internet billboards became popular. Uh, it seemed like that there were some atheists out there who didn't believe in God. We were going to play a big joke, and they put this on the internet billboards. If you remember, internet billboards were the beginning of the internet, basically, where you could go and post things. And uh, that started about the 1980s, and by the time the 1990s rolled around, mid-1990s, you had the Angel Fire websites, which allowed people to open up free websites, and that the whole theory merged from the billboards over to the Angel Fire sites. And now you have it on YouTube and all kinds of other websites that are out there that are promoting this theory, and most of them, almost all of them, are promoted by atheists. And some of these people who have denied Messiah, uh, you know, amongst believers... Um, of the of God and of Torah, have clung onto this and are. So let's get a little let's get a little into the depth. So understand what I'm saying here, right? We are actually going to be looking into the depth of this history. So the deepest depth of this history to understand that Flavius Josephus is not the same as this individual. His, his understanding of who's Flavia Josephus is not, is not a, hit, a mystery. Traitor, someone who acts against his comrades, his people, or his country, and aids the enemy. The person who joins the enemy's ranks in wartime is a traitor. He was no traitor. He was a high-ranking army officer, general of the Northern Command, who fought for his people and did all he could until all hope was lost. That's treason. <laughs> That's survival. In the year 66 CE, the people of Jerusalem rose up against the Roman oppressors, and fierce riots broke out all over the city. The countdown had begun. The Jewish people is going to war. Command over the Galilee, from whence the Romans were expected to attack, was given to a young Jerusalemite priest from an aristocratic family named Joseph ben Mattathias. That summer, a tough, venerated Roman general named Vespasian comes to Israel. He and his son Titus stand at the head of a professional Roman army of over 60,000 soldiers hungry for battle. The earth trembles. The Jewish defenses collapse like a house of cards. Village after village falls to the Romans. Houses go up in flames and thousands are slaughtered or sent to do forced labor or participate in bloody war games. The commander of the Galilean uprising, Joseph ben Mattathias, flees to Tiberias before even raising his sword at the enemy. The attempt to fight the Romans on the open field fails. But the Galileans aren't finished yet. Under Joseph's command, they gather in the fortified cities and continue to fight. The first battle takes place here in Yodfat. And leading the Jewish troops is Joseph ben Mattathias. The Galileans take full advantage of the height of their isolated hill. He managed to escape along with 40 dignitaries from Yodfat and hid with them in a cave underneath the ground. So you know what happens? Now it Joseph doesn't go is surrounded well, by death. Right? It doesn't go well. He loses, right? They come together. They debate what to do. They draw straws. They say, basically, whoever... Draws the straw, gonna kill themselves, right? Because they thought if they get caught by the Romans, being a general of, of the Romans, you know what happens, right? They're gonna go through some crazy stuff, right? But let's see what happens at the end. Imagine the moment when Joseph comes out of the cave. The two enemies, Vespasian and Joseph, now stand face to face. Joseph realizes his end is near, and in a last resort attempt to save his life, he says to Vespasian, You imagine, Vespasian, that in the person of Josephus you have taken a mere captive, but I come to you as a messenger of greater destinies sent on this errand by God. You will be emperor, Vespasian, you and your son here. Bind me then yet more securely in chains and keep me for yourself, for you, Caesar, are master not of me only, but of land and sea and the whole human race. What convinced Vespasian to accept Joseph's request? Was it his gift of prophecy or his gift for flattery? 
Or maybe Vespasian thought he could use Joseph later to help defeat Jerusalem. One way or the other, Joseph remains alive. Later he... All right, so he just talks about, you know, what goes on, the place gets besieged, I am not... right? And Joseph, Joseph is talks about, he says, I'm not, a, I'm not a traitor, but he ended up getting the name, this name is very important. Secrets of the future. Right, a heavenly spirit, Maloney, he wanted to save his skin. And what a name he took on, Josephus Titus Flavius. After the man who destroyed the holy temple. In Rome, Josephus continued to defend his people and fight against Jew hatred. I wouldn't call that treason. And so we're gonna we'll talk about this. So it's one of those big things, right? We got he got this name and all those things had happened and whatnot. So that's some very, very important stuff, right? Some very, very important stuff. But let's 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 keep on going. So we're gonna talk about this Piso thing and the connections with it. Now that you got all the history, right? Almost all the history. We'll, we'll get a little more history on Josephus just for the sake of understanding. Hey guys. So this is just some this is just some um extra historical sources, right? This individual, he pulls up extra historical sources, right? Arabic sources, different sources, early first century sources that talks about basically, you know, defending the faith. It talks about basically how early the writings of um the things that happened to Christ to Christians, how early those things are. So just a little information, a little interesting video on these things um, right here. So I'm actually going to show the ending. I'll show the ending to this because the ending is very interesting. Let me just show you something. Hey, guys. Real fast. Let me show you something. Let me Remember I said that? Became an remember I said that there is no atheist, historian, any professional that denies the historicity of Christ? Listen to Bart Baker. Expert in fast. New Testament Expert. textual criticism. Dr. Ehrman is himself not a Christian and a professed unbeliever and critic of Christianity. Yet Dr. Ehrman himself has gone on record and opposed this very uneducated and uninformed view. Bart Ehrman, not Baker, Ehrman. But watch what he says here. Watch what this individual says here on Biasly. You. So I'll go ahead and let him have the last word. It is, it is not, I mean, I know in the, in the crowds you all run around with, it's commonly thought that Jesus did not exist. Let me tell you, once you get outside of your conclave, there's nobody who, I mean, this is not even an issue for scholars of antiquity. There is no scholar in any college or university in the Western world who teaches classics, ancient history, New Testament, early Christianity, any related field who doubts that Jesus existed. There, the reason for thinking Jesus existed is because he is abundantly attested in early sources. I think that atheists have done themselves a, mis, a, a disservice by jumping on the bandwagon of mythicism because frankly it makes, it makes you look foolish to the outside world. If that's what you're going to believe, you just look foolish. Uh, you, you are much better off going with historical evidence and arguing historically rather than coming up with the theory that Jesus did. Hey guys, thank you. So if you see anyone who says Jesus doesn't exist, not even scholars say that. Scholars don't say that historically Messiah exists. That's that's very important. If someone's concluding that he's a, a, a story, they're not looking at the scholarly work. That's very important. But let me go to something here and show you something here. All right. All right, so I'm going to go to something here. Now we're going to dive deep into this conclusion here. Normal thing for the Romans to have these different kind of titles and names and pseudonyms they gave themselves. Now it says here, the first source that we look for information on Arius Piso and his family is in the work done on this subject by Abelard Ruchlin, the true authorship of the New Testament. This is the very first work that actually talks about Arius Calpurnius Piso and his family as the authors of the New Testament. One thing that should be noted is, as of this writing, Abelard Ruchlin has corrected the few things in his work which were incorrect for whatever reason, typos, misquotes, one of the main things that he had mentioned, Lucius Calpurnius Piso as Arius Piso's father. 
All right, so remember we talked about those Lucas. Remember we talked about this individual. This was the father, right? He was the father of those individuals. And then remember he got his name changed, and then he had a son with the same exact last name, and a name is him. And his father and his father and his father had the same exact last name, but apparently this one had a son. That's what we're going to talk about, that he's going to have a son, right? Which we talked about here. Remember this individual? We talked about this person, right? His name changed, right? This name right here is actually this name. This individual, see what's going on there? Very important. This is, a, this is actually going to be the same. It's going to be a son of that individual. Very important. But he's going to have a conspiracy right there. It's very important. So he's going to have a conspiracy. But let's talk about what let's talk about what he does. So it's very important to note his sons. Let's go down a little bit. Note who his sons is. Right. You see what's going on. Piso also survived. By his son, right? He's gonna talk about his son. We already talked about this individual, right? Remember, he died early, right? A lot of these individuals die before 70, right? He talks about this right here. He talks about this individual also died before 70. By Vin Spazen, Vin Spazen slayed a lot of these individuals. A lot of people don't know that. Vin Spazen is a different family than the, than the Piso family. But here's a here's a different individual, right? We talked about these, right? It talks about those and whatnot. Let me just see if that's the one I was looking for on here. The step. I think this this one has the talk of the step. Let me make sure. No, nah, it's it on a different note. I'll go. I'll go to that one real fast um, after this. But remember, we talked about that. This connection, these connections, is very important, right? Remember, we talked about that. It's very important. Let's keep on. Let's go. Let's keep on going. Let's keep on keeping on. So we talk about these individuals. Now let's get into these things a little more in depth. Now, I already went over some of these things, like. This one, we went over, remember, he tried to say, hey, Zeus, and stuff like that. And also, remember, I talked about the earthquake reports, right? Just going to show this real fast, right? Remember, I talked about how the biblical narrative has history. We're going to get into peso, peso, and get to the origins of it. But first, let's debunk some quick claims here, some quick claims. At that time, what had been noticed, it is written that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to bottom at Jesus' death in Matthew 27:50 meaning there was damage to the Jewish temple. That should have been recorded somewhere other than the Bible, as the Jews would have been very pro protective of their temple if somebody had entered there in an aggressive manner such as this. In another incident, Jesus threatens to destroy the temple, Matthew 26, 61, and he's calling the Jews sons of Satan, which was blasphemy and deserved the death penalty. Again, it can be so obviously Jews been calling Jews sons of, of Satan. Look at in the Old Testament, sons of Bali. They've been saying this all the time. That's just something that happens, right? But obviously, for the sake of understanding, there's a false statement here, right? It says that the remember that was an earthquake that had happened. It said that should have been recorded. Remember, we already talked about that. There's an earthquake that had happened. It should have been recorded, right? It was recorded. It's called an earthquake report, right? We already talked about the earthquake reports, right? It's recorded, right, in the time of Messiah, right? Not 31, not 300 years later, but exactly in the time of Messiah, because we talked about it, the exact time Messiah was baptized was, was baptized was 27 AD, and he was crucified in 31 AD. Because remember, just because it says 33 AD, we know earthquakes are not pinpoint, right? That's an estimate of the time of the earthquake. We could talk about that in different places. It was 30 to 33 AD, right? is the earthquake that we was talking about at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus, right? All right, let's keep on going. Let's keep on going. So obviously it's talked about, and it can even be understood to the exacts, right? They talk about it in other places as talked about. Early first century, obviously, talks about the events of basically, you know, earthquake in 31 AD, pretty much, whatnot. And it just talks about its connection with the gospel of Matthew and all these things. We can talk about that, yes, it was an earthquake, it was indeed an earthquake. In fact, on their site, they wrote that the earthquake was in connection with Christ's resurrection. We talked about that, right? Very important. And getting the pinpoints of those things. We can even get even get the earthquakes, other earthquakes, like the earthquake with Paul, and talk about the location with that and how we know that was a real earthquake that had happened in that area. That was something that had happened as well. So a lot of earthquake reports in the biblical narrative are actually documented. Very important. Earthquake reports. See those evidence of that. Um, also, this piece right here. Before we get into Piso, another uh, rebuttal, a little clear clarity to something. Of Palestine. Despite scholarly efforts to detect an underlying Aramaic original for Mark or Matthew, 
right? They've never been able to really find that. It is probable that all the evangelists wrote in the common Koine Greek of their... So remember, he's saying, remember, we talked about that. They said they didn't have the Aramaic text, but remember, we talked about it when we talked about the name Yeshua. We talked about how they do indeed, in fact, have the Aramaic text. They have the first century Aramaic text. It's something that is um, widely known. We already talked about that. Close that. Keep on going here. So just to get a little understanding, if you ever heard someone try to discredit the Septuagint, it's because they don't know what the Septuagint is. The Septuagint, right? I can go into detail on it, but this is just here for the sake of understanding because I've seen people try to dis um, discredit the Septuagint. The Septuagint was, it was 72 Hebrews that basically came together, a couple of different Hebrews, and recorded the Septuagint, having it documented, right? So it's about 72 translators from Jerusalem. This is, this is great because, remember, these are original Judeans. They're taking the, the, the Hebrew and translating it to the Greek. So that is allowing us to have pure copies by these 72 um, Judeans that's overlooking this, those Hebrew J J Jews looking over these documents, and making sure that others are getting the exact word for word New Testament, right? Or Old Testament, Old Testament, right? Only the Old Testament in the third century BC, right? Now, obviously, you got to understand also in that time, you know, they're always going to have their little extra two cents to throw in and whatnot. Josephus and other individuals talk about that, that there is a lot of different books and whatnot uh, amongst the groups. But later on, you got to know that the, the New Testament, the documents of the New Testament were given to the first saints, right? It was a deeds of all the first saints that was canonized late, later. And it was given to the universal or Catholic, right? The quote unquote Catholic. What does it mean Catholic? Where the word Catholic come from? You know, Catholic is actually a Greek word. Catholic actually just means universal. So when you hear the word Catholic, there's your Catholic with a little C and the Catholic with a big C, right? Sometimes you hear the word Catholic. That's a that's a Greek word. Very important. So just being universal. The universal church. When they say Catholic church, it was universal church. But when the Roman Catholic later on start getting that, they start changing the understanding of the churches. So that when you hear the word Catholic or Roman Catholic, know that Roman Catholic is usually like your um, Middle Ages. You're after your time of... Um, Charlemagne, right? When Charlemagne get, in, get into office and he starts becoming um, his own ruler, when the Germanics start getting it. But early church, when you start seeing the word Catholic being thrown around, it's not always thrown around, but you might see it very rarely. But it's a, it's a Greek word that means universal. That's very important to understand. It's said very um, early, right? Very early by different individuals, just to get a little understanding if you see that word, right? Don't get... Um, confused some people see that word like see they always been romans well you got no linguistics very important to know now let's let's keep on going this part i'm going to skip and go down it's going to go let me just see what this one is this one is important too remember that the idea with piso and all that stuff saying that they made christ you know that even the modern catholics don't agree with that that idea and they have a, a, a great reason why the Romans didn't invent Christ. And it's very easy to understand. Even so, the reason is very clear. Let me just read something they say. Second, if at will's thesis is right, right, then not only did Jesus never exist, neither did Peter, James, or Paul. In fact, that would have been there would have been no Christians at all before the destruction of the temple of 70 AD. So if the book of Mark was supposedly written in 60 AD and you had to spread the gospel at that time, why is it that we see Christians there before 70 AD, even earlier? And we got writings all the way to 50 AD, earlier than that time, right? When we talk about the dedicate and stuff like that, the writings of the saints were already recorded. There were already Christians at that time, right? It's basically what they're concluding, right? It says, but we know this isn't true because the Roman historian Tacticus records in his annals, right? Book 1544, that Roman emperor blames the great fire in Rome, right? Which took place three years before the Jewish revolt on the group called Christians, right? Even if Tacticus were in on the act, how could the Romans have fabricated the existence of churches, right? 
such as those of Ephesus or Thessalonia, or how you say it, Thessalonica. How you say that? Thessalonica. How you say that? Basically, these are real churches, is what he's saying here. You can look it up, YouTube it, right? The seven churches of Revelation. There's still evidence of those churches. That's very important, that those churches were there a long time ago, right? Suppose that they existed, right? According to the book of Acts, right, for decades before the Jewish revolt, right, wouldn't the first Jews who joined the Christian church realize something was not quite right about the movement that sprang overnight, right? Very important. Basically, it's concluding, right, it's meaning, meaning if we have other sources of different individual Christians with the gossip talking of the same people, place, places, events, then the, 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 the message is true, right? Then the message is true. Vince, I'm just going to put, then the message is true, right? Because that's what it basically means. Then the message is true, right? The. Then the message is true. Just to make it, just to make it uh, simple, right? Just to give a conclusion to what they're saying here. They're saying, basically, how can someone conclude that after 70 AD, that's when we're going to see Christianity rise, when we see it before that? That's so much evidence that shows that it was before that event. Um, this is just some different rebukes right here. I'm not going to show it right now. I'm just going to go down and get to, and this is just some earlier documents. We already went over this. I'm going to go down. These, these ones, I'm going to go a little more into detail another time. All right. But let's go into, let's, let's continue. Let's put continue here. So we can go down and continue with this mystery. Now let's continue with this mystery. We could end it here and continue, continue with this into deeper um maybe we should maybe we could we end it and continue with this and continue from here um i would say that so far we got the history just to get a little understanding should we continue should we continue with this or should we uh, proceed I've, in fact you know what what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue let's continue and let's finish this uh, whole thing so get a little understanding this is just the world history of christianity little understanding before we start to get really deep into these things, right? Early Christianity, get a little understanding or whatnot. This one is just going to give us like some summaries of different things and whatnot. A lot of things were known in that time, right? A lot of things are known with that time and today, right? Just talk about what happened, right? We already know, right? We know that Nero, right? We know that he himself, as recorded, by Tacticus, he persecuted Christians, right? Very important. He blamed the Christians and whatnot. We already went over that. It also, the Christians were under persecution, under Demation, right? Very important. We talked about John and the historicity behind that. Very important, right? Early Christian persecution. We already know that happened there. We'll get into some of these things a little later. But let's go. Let's get down into some information real fast on Peso. So let's continue on to this, right? Let me just show a timestamp here. 8.30. Josephus becomes an incredibly suspicious individual, especially due to one, the known fact that the message of the New Testament emerged after the war. Because when this man surrendered to the future emperor Vespasian, he was treated exceptionally well thereafter. All right, so was he was that the whole story? Was he treated well and whatnot, and he just gave up? And they said, "Hey, you know, all is well," and that's exactly how it went. Most people who look into history of this, they already know what happened, right? They know basically, they know it didn't go that smooth, right? That was just one of those things that there is no doubt that there was a struggle, right, with those things. Let me just go down to something. I'm just making sure I put this little uh, video here. I think I did or I didn't as I wanted to go over the history of Josephus. And I was noted that this little thing wasn't here because now we're going to get into the conspiracy. We're going to start talking about the conspiracy and get into understanding on these things. Let me just see where is this. In fact, I don't know where this uh, little video is. I was wondering because when I was I was scrolling, I was like, where is this little video? I want to show you a little summary of Josephus, the life of Josephus. I'll just I'll just search it real fast. It's not too hard to find. Just looking to see. All right. All right. Let's put it down on this thing. 
I'm just looking. All right. All right, all right, all right. But I look too long. All right, let me let me actually type it down because that's a, there's something on here I didn't get a chance to show. So we're gonna get into the detail of this individual, but let me make sure because see we already went over some of these, right? We went over the history of the Flavian family, right? We went a little history of some of the things of Josephus, right? Let's look it up here to make sure it wasn't up there. No, all right. Josephus right here. Just making sure ain't no video there. All right. Let me actually put this here. All right. All right, let me grab something, a little video. Now, I just need to show this for the sake of understanding, like we said, with the history. There's a lot of historical accounts on Josephus, right? Very important to know his name isn't just Josephus, but Titus Flavius Josephus. This is just something that's important. If you've never seen this, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play it all, but I'm gonna copy it and I'm gonna put it right here. And I and this is not the one I'm looking for though. But that's that's an important one. But there's one right here. I'm just gonna play this just to show you the history. Most people know this history, but this is a fast little summary of the basic history to understand. Um, and it's all contested for. Aftermath of his crucifixion. And the elites of Jesus' time were also still the elites of Josephus' time. Today we call this man Flavius Josephus, but that was not the name at his birth. He was born as Joseph ben Matiahu in Jerusalem and CE to a Jewish noble family. He would have been raised around those who feared the following Jesus and the early Christians had obtained. According to his autobiography, Josephus was a very astute learner and very knowledgeable about Jewish law. I was commended by all for the love I had to learning. On which account, the high priests and principal men of the city came then frequently to me together, in order to know my opinion about the accurate understanding of points of the law. Whether or not this is true is uncertain. He could just be tooting his own horn out of vanity, but considering his writings were targeted at a Roman audience, I'm going to assume that this was more done to establish his credentials among the Romans than for reasons of ego. Being from a noble family, Josephus began his training for the priesthood at the age of 16, at which time there were three main sects of the priests the Essenes, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. Over the next three years, Josephus would go through the training for all three sects, but he would eventually end up choosing the Pharisees. Being now 19 years old, and begun to conduct myself according to the rules of the Pharisees, revolt against the Romans. Click the subscribe button and the bell icon to never miss a video. At the age of 26, he was sent to Rome to negotiate with Emperor Nero for the release of a dozen Jewish priests held- Remember we talked about that when he was, was sent up to go negotiate, then he returned back? by the Romans. By the time he returned home to Jerusalem in 66 CE, the Jews had started a revolt against the Romans. The leaders of the revolt gave him military command of Galilee, where he successfully resisted the Romans until he was captured in 67 CE. He was captured in Yadfat, a village in southern Galilee, where the Romans besieged the Jewish garrison. Josephus was trapped in a cage with about 40 of his companions. There was no escape and there was no way they could defeat the Romans, and they didn't want to be captured either but they couldn't commit suicide because that was an unforgivable sin. So Josephus created this elaborate system in which they would draw lots and kill each other until there was only one person left who would have to commit suicide. This scenario actually inspired a interesting mathematical formula that became referred to as Josephus' problem, to which videos you can find about it will be in the upper right-hand corner. After a lot of stabbing, there were only two people left, and so Josephus convinced that other person to, instead of stabbing each other, to instead go surrender to the Romans. The Roman generals they surrendered to were Vespasian and his son Titus. When Josephus met Vespasian, he claimed that he had received a prophetic vision while trapped in the cave, and in that vision he said that Vespasian would become emperor. Vespasian didn't know exactly what to make of this, so he made Josephus his slave and tasked him with being a translator and negotiator for his war in Judea. Josephus would spend the next two years negotiating with warring factions in Judea until he was freed in 69 CE after Vespasian became emperor, believing that Josephus' prophecy was of divine origin. 
Both Vespasian and his son, Titus, would become emperor. It was at this point that he changed his name from Joseph ben Matiahu to Flavius Josephus, adopting the family name of the Vespasians, and Romanizing his personal name. Josephus was considered by Jews at the time, and by many still today, as a traitor. But his inclinations towards the Romans could have been seen earlier than this. His choice to join the Pharisees had been based on its similarities with the Greek Stoic philosophers, and when he went to Rome, he was very impressed with the infrastructure and lifestyle and just everything Roman. And this continued defenses of his religion as being a truly ancient one in comparison with the religion of the Greeks and the Romans. Even in the Jewish wars, he condemned other historians who painted a negative portrait of the Jews and sought to have a morally balanced view. His other great work was a history of the world from the Jewish perspective, the antiquities of the Jews, which he hoped would soften the Roman view of the Jews after the rebellion. By the time Josephus died in 100 CE, he had had five wives and three children to survive childhood. And so, there's a life of Josephus. If you're interested in learning so a little important history before we move forward, right? Just to get an understanding of who is Josephus, right? We already talked about that. No connection to these individuals. But now let's get into the deep in, uh, history behind certain individuals, right? Very important. We go to a timestamp here. Just to clarify something again. The use of multiple names to refer to one individual, the Roman senator of the first century, Gaius Calpirinus Piso. Right, if you guys remember, that was Arius Calpurnus Piso's dad. Arius is Josephus, known for the... So just for clarity, remember, this person is actually the dad of this person, and this person is going to have the one that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about that individual and go into some um, understandings of that, which I think, is it on this one? Nah, no, nah, this one. We're gonna, we're gonna get very deep into it. We're gonna get very deep into it, right? Pisonian conspiracy. So remember we talked about that conspiracy, let's get deep into it, right? Now, what happened? What's up with that conspiracy? What happened? It's no secret. Um, this is what happened. I'm gonna show you what happened. Little understanding of the uh, understanding of history, right? Basically, the conspiracy was a major conspiracy, right? They wanted to kill Nero, right? They wanted to slay him and whatnot. But what happened? The conspiracies got the conspirators got caught. They got caught in the conspiracy, and it, and it didn't work out because somebody told someone told. And we're gonna look at this thing and we're gonna look at these names and whatnot. Let me just show you something in summary. After, um, the treat of torture right basically someone was a torture right uh, net alice broke and named peso right now this is very important now we gotta understand what's going on here peso and a man named who's this man so peso which peso is he talking about remember the person part of the conspiracy is this person well necessarily in the sense of understanding well this person who you're seeing here just to make it just to make it clear um i think i clicked the wrong one real fast yeah right here so this this individual here remember this person right here where it talks about you know died in 70 ad this person right this is another person note here the conspirator he's gonna be part of this conspiracy this person died right he died in 65 AD. Why? Because Nero, we're going to go to it. Nero basically, um, we're going to talk about it. We'll talk about what Nero made him do. Let's just read it. So right here, all right, Peso. So that person, this individual right here, right? I don't know what just happened there. Go back. This individual who died in, remember, there's there's a couple, there's a couple different ones, right? This one right here died in 20 AD, right? This one right here died in 70 AD, right? And then this one right here died in 95 AD. Forced suicide, right? We want to note who made him do forced suicide. Very important, All right? Go back to this little reading. It says, so he named Piso and then this person. This is who we want to see. This this person, this name, you will be surprised what name, what, what we actually see here. Let me actually just refresh this and go back down. That name there is the name we want to find. You wouldn't have suspected at first, but now we finally found the person. We're gonna we're gonna see that we found the person, right? Because 
we're going to talk about that name, Flavius and stuff, and the connection with these things and, and certain people um, who this is connected to. Now we're getting to the ending of who's Piso and his connection to the Flavian family and whatnot. Now we're seeing what's going on here. So you see how major this? We probably we probably took like an hour, two hours, three hours. Who knows how long it's been? I don't even know exactly. But this is very important. Now we're getting to the end of it, All right? I don't know what's going on here, All right? This is this is something else. It's the good emperor to close this. All right. Let me just see what's up here with this note. I'm gonna close this note thing and open it again because that note thing was behaving weird didn't want to move from me i'm gonna get a little deeper into it so remember we was talking about this plot and everything and we would talk about how basically right what happened with nero right it's very important we know he killed himself but with this one this individual with the conspirators there was 41 conspirators in total right it talks, it talks about P Piso was the basically figurehead. He was the one that basically everyone was respecting, right? He was the one that was basically, you would consider like, they were saying he was basically one of the leaders, right? If not the leader of the group, right? So let's talk about those things and whatnot, all right? And, and they obviously caught him and what they what they do, right? We'll talk about that once his note opens. We'll talk about what happened, right? Now we're getting deeper into the understanding of this mystery, right? How are they trying to connect this? Let's go down and talk about it. All right. Let this uh, low get down here. All right. So now let's talk about it. So what happened there? What was what was the deal with all that that was going on there with this conspiracy? Let me just go down while this thing loads. All right. Almost done loading there. That's just narcissism down there. Don't want to go too low. Let me make sure we're in the right spot here. All right. Just letting it load real fast because these notes are fairly large. And always, is always in the description for free. Because everything I do is for free. All right, so watch, watch what it says here. So remember, we talked about that individual. I'm going to copy this because we're going to find this name again. This one right here, this exact name. Otherwise known as a famous philosopher, you see this right here, um, Seneca, or how you say that, Seneca, the younger. You see that See that name, the younger? Remember, we were talking about the younger? We're going to see something with that. But watch what it says. Nero encouraged Piso to commit suicide in the statement obviously basically severed the art arteries of each arm and bled to death. So remember we talked about that? The individual was forced suicide. So he was forced suicide, right? It's going to be a little different than the other ones and whatnot. This one was died in battle. This one died in another conspiracy, a different, different thing that happened, right? But we talked about some things, right? We talked about how he had a brother, right? This one. We talked about this individual, right? Remember we had talked a little bit about him. Right. But this is going to be another individual. Right. It just lets you know in this time frame, it says he faced um, things that happened. And he obviously was killed. Right. He was killed by an individual. This is this is going to be a brother of this individual. But going back. Right. So remember, again, this individual who died in 20 AD, he had a brother, also met the same fate. Right. By another problem, a problematic. But there's another individual who we're going to know here. So his father was one individual. His other, this other individual is another individual. But now we're going to talk about the son of one of these individuals. We're going to get into depth now. And we'll, we'll bring it home when we get home. I know it sounds, there's a lot that's going on, a lot that's going on. But let's get an understanding of this. So continuing on, this one's just a, a little information of the conspiracy. Here's a little bit about the conspiracy. Let's get a little information on it. So just talks about the conspiracy by this individual. And remember, this individual was the one that was for suicide. So that's the one that was for suicide we talked about earlier. So that's the one who was caught with the conspiracy and was killed, 75 AD. Very important. So Nero forced him to commit suicide. Long story short, it's the end of the conspiracy. But what was the what was the reason? Right? What was the what was the reason? What was the madness behind the conspiracy? Why 
why did all that happen, right? What was the reason behind the conspiracy, right? Here's the, I'm going to show you the real story. Here's the real story behind what, what happened there. So here's the real story. And we're going to get into certain names or not. All right. So remember that Lucas, uh, Lucis, or how you say that? Lucis, right? This name right here, this this name right here, the younger. Remember we were talking about this, this name right here, right? You can see right here, remember Piso and this individual, right? Piso and this individual. So who is this? Lucas, right? Let's go down a little bit and understand what we're seeing here. So who are we looking for? We got to know we're looking for a certain name of an individual that has an important name. So let's understand what's going on. This, these are actually related to basically the Julian descent and, and Cleopatra and stuff like that. Marcus Anthony, right? Marcus Anthony line goes down. And what does he have, right? What children do he have? He has a certain one here, but... The one we want to look at is this one right here. Marcus Antonus, right? Arius Calpanius, or how you say that, Calpanius, Peso, a.k.a. Flavius Josephus, right? Not Titus Flavius Josephus, but this individual here, right? Marcus Antonus, a son of Marcus Antonus, right? Coming from the line of this individual, being all connected to the Piso family, right? These were caught in the conspiracy. These were all caught in the conspiracy. This is very important, right? Talk about AKA Flavius Josephus, right? Very important. Not the same Flavius Josephus. This is a different family connected to Marcus Anthony. Because remember, Flavius Josephus is son of Matthew. That's very important. He's also contested with other writings, right? We already seen that it historically told us that Flavius Josephus did make a prophecy to Vinspazin. So if he already was dealing with Vinspazin, and we know that these individuals weren't dealing with Vinspazin, that's important, right? It's very, very important to get a little understanding on these in individuals. Um, it goes into to information, to detail on these individuals and everything. Long story short, the whole family line is gone by the Vinspazin time. That's very important. The whole family tree is gone. But they were basically angry. I'm going to show you why they were angry. They were angry because people were taking their land and everything. But let's go a little more information on this um, individual. So who he was connected to, this individual here, right? Remember part of the um, Pontius or Pesoian conspiracy, right? The idea to assassinate Nero, right? They want to assassinate Nero, right? But the individual, what happened? The individual also was forced to what? know what happened he got caught right he got caught and it, and, it, and it didn't end so well right it's very important he died how did he die right you already know right he got caught in a conspiracy nero in which he was likely um to have been innocent just talk about some things talk about whatnot whatnot uh, but basically it says he basically suicide you know said talks about he committed suicide long story short let's get get right to what happened so this individual remember all these were happening before 70 a.d a lot of these individuals were going through all these different things and they had all types of um, ideas and stuff. But even when you look at the idea of his conspiracy, right? Talk about his conspiracy was caught in the aftermath of the conspiracy, a plot to kill Nero, right? But what happened, you know? It was something that basically the individual, you know, it talks about Nero ordered um, basically his wife to be saved from the thing and whatnot. But, you know, they were... Um, killed you know at the end of it basically he severed their veins and whatnot and they bled to death right the whole conspiracy was that a lot of them were caught a lot of people were caught in this conspiracy a lot of people 40 different people were caught in this conspiracy and a lot of times this conspiracy is blown out of water misunderstood um, a lot of people think they combine it with the idea of christianity and stuff like that this has nothing to do with christianity it has a, it has to do with a classic roman um conspirators coming against each other like what they did with julius caesar and killing someone someone must have took the idea blown it out blown it out of water uh, that's what happened here but it apparently had to do with some land that's apparently what it had to do with some land here's a little video on that <laughs>
Today we're on the Vicus Ugarius, which leads from the Formularium into the form itself. And what we have here is a very old kippus. And who made it? Why is it here? We have the story in Latin. And what we have is Calpurnius Piso and Marcus Salvius. These people are praetors of the treasury of Rome, and they're marking where there is public land. Did you remember what names it's, it said on there, right? Remember, it, we were just talking about those names, right? It's very important. Let's go back to here. Marcus, right? Remember we talked about that Marcus, Marcus Salvia, right? Very important. It's saying that basically the conspirators were Piso, right? Family of Piso and Marcus, right? Connected with Marcus, right? These individuals, these this family, right, or these groups of people came together to kill Nero, right? It's very important. But that's why when the Flavian family came, right, even though you see a lot of these individuals have connections of words of the Flavian, right? Flavius, M.T. Flavius, right? That's why they have Flavius, this person, having connections of the name, right? They having different names, right? But they themselves, even in the sense of it, were wiped out. They didn't even have time to even make a plot. They were destroyed. That's very important. Um, that's why when you're looking at these names, even in that sense, when they're saying Josephus, note, many people had the same names, but you got to note who is who and what is what, right? You can look at, for example, um, Herod. Look at Herod's sons. Herod had multiple sons with the same name. This is one of those examples of uh, things like that, right? Um, just talk about some things. Just talk about different individuals and whatnot. Um, what happened, right? It was not a great thing, but this is a little family tree to get a little understanding on that. We'll get a little deeper into it. What not? Let's click something here, right? It's the reason. This this the reason why that happened, right? The reason for the season, right? It all basically crumbled down because of that conspiracy. It and it was nothing. It's nothing more than a conspiracy against Nero. That's what it. That's really what it comes down to, right? Um, so it's just talking about that. It was basically, this basically is, they basically, long story short, they set up a, a, a thing saying, basically, this is our land, is what they were saying. They're saying, this, this land that you see here, what they were basically setting a stone there and saying, this land is our land, is what they were claiming here. They were saying, in this little area, zoom out, right? It was in Italy, right? They were claiming that a part of land was their land, right? But you know how it goes a lot of times when people with, with stronger power, they want to take that land. So these two individuals, right, they were killed 65 AD. So very important in 65 AD. But this, but even so, this, well, this individual, I'll copy this and show you who this individual is. But this individual died, right? We already talked about that, right? A little later, right? Remember that names be changing and stuff? Let me just show you this individual to get a more understanding on him, right? I'm going to show you now real fast. I don't, not this one. Let me make sure I grab the one I was looking for, right? Get a little understanding on him, right? You can see a little understanding. And if you remember, Remember we just talk about the time of the four emperors and stuff like that? You can see fair, uh, relation, Marcus, right? Stilvius, Otho, you see what's going on there? Major connection. So a lot of the things that were happening were cir is circling back around. Remember we was talking about the year of the four emperors? The year 69 is known as the year of the four emperors, right? Remember that? This is a different. Now, this is a different individual. Later on, right? Later on, there was obviously major conspiracies, connections, with other people with these things is what you're seeing here major connections major conspiracies that's why when you see when i remember i said these individuals called the younger and stuff right having connection to all these things right very important right and they talk about they'll talk about basically you know that's when you'll see the confusion when they'll try to say oh they had um connections with making the new testament right even on here if you look closely it'll say right here it talks about this philosophy is the founder for, they say this little thing, so philosophy is um, basically the content for the New Testament, right? They talk about some things in connection with that, right? What not. But what do we know? That's not what they were doing. They didn't, they didn't really make the New Testament because it's too much evidence 
that the New Testament was established by a historical figure by the name of Yeshua. And he had multiple disciples who are historically contested for it. That's very important. But this is an example of, of when you look at these things, you got to go, you got to look at it carefully. But noting the family connection is going to give you a major connection to these things, right? So just to get a little understanding, a little understanding on this thing, what what's the um, what's all the talk about? What's the what's the deal with all this? It's basically a conspiracy. All has been, as you see, it almost looks like a giant circle because it is a giant circle. It's it's basically taking a conspiracy with multiple different conspirators, which you can basically go around this circle for years and and come to a dead end because the same um, understanding that we already know that the end, the same individuals that was part of the plot were killed. The people that were part of the plot were end up being killed. That's very important. So a lot of people they were end up being killed, but the because people hear the word conspiracy and things like that and all these related names and stuff, which is like it's like trying to find a relation in names today, right? If I want to find a, a, a relation with a name, a, someone with the name um, uh, John Smith, right? And I find I can find multiple people with the name John Smith. But you got to be careful when looking at pinpoints of names. Notice that the individual and the way that you basically end this at a dead end you know this individual name isn't Titus Flavius Josephus, right? This individual right here, whose name they say, aka um, Flavius Josephus, because remember, a lot of them also had different names, aka Flavia, right? Aria the first, right? Or aka Flavius Sabinus, right? Just because they have similar names doesn't mean they're the same people. That's important. So that's why knowing history of these individuals is going to give clarity to who is who, right? So be careful on when you see conclusions for these things and whatnot, when they go into different pieces of the conclusion and everything, you can find the relation and you can find out what actually happened, what is the real story behind those things and whatnot. Um, these individuals obviously are going to be um, individuals who you're going to note yourself being connected to Mark. If you know Marcus Anthony, connected to Cleopatra's line and stuff like that and whatnot. But that line was wiped out. So that's just very that's very important to note that that whole conspiracy to make it short. That whole conspiracy, and we'll go if we need to. We'll go deeper, but it's really no need. Because once you understand that the whole conspiracy was based upon name games, it's based upon name games. The conspiracy has, it doesn't go like what people think it is. There's no evidence at all for them writing it. There's only the evidence of people circling around name games. Name games is a foolish thing to fall into to say just because someone has a similar name, not even the full complete same name. If someone has a similar name, you don't take that name and say this person's the same person because it doesn't work like that. So basically, at the, at the end of the story, it was someone basically taking a conclusion of all these plots and saying, well, this person's name is Flavius Josephus. But if you know Josephus' whole name is actually Titus Flavius Josephus. So this is very important um, to understand the difference with these individuals. So and if you want to read a little more into it, um, Obviously, it goes into depth into like with other stuff. I'm not gonna get any more deeper than that, but let's let's understand it from here. Just to get the summary right here. Here's here's basically what happened. I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you what happened here. Let's talk about what happened. So obviously, there was a conspiracy, right? Family known for conspiracies and stuff like that for trying to kill people, and their conspiracies is usually trying to get into the rulership, get become a ruler in Rome. This individual had a son, right? This individual, right? Very important. You're going to have two, two of these individuals here, right? They're going to be very important to take note of, right? It's very important. I'm just going to go down and just show you something, right? Just talks about, because there's a lot of, when I say a lot of people involved, it was basically like the Piso family was basically like involved with this, right? It just talks about they were involved. This one, obviously, was found and he was ordered to kill himself, right? We talked about this. Um, and then there was another one, another Piso, right? His son, right? Piso, his son, right? Another son. We talked about this individual, right? He died too by Vince Spazen, right? Vince Spazen slayed him. He ended up dying, 
right? Mostly all their, almost all their family was basically wiped out. This is best best way to understand it. It's like a, most of their family um, was wiped out. Um, and then by the time of his phase in, all that came to a end. That's very important when it came to his final end through all that. This individual died, right? And then remember, we talk about this individual, right? Vince Spazen himself, right? Killed by a supporter of Vince Spazen, right? Very important, this individual, right? Get an understanding on that. But what happens afterwards, we get, you know, different family members, different individuals that uh, basically lived their life afterwards. It, it was a conspiracy that went on. And by the time of Vince Spazen, it was cut off. By the time of Vince Spazen, who is different than the other individuals, it came to his end. So it's very important to understand that. So best way to summarize it, it was a conspiracy, right? That many people were involved in, 41 different people, right? Talks about different things which had happened, right? Even Tacticus talks about it. Um, he talks about according to Flavius, right? Flavius or Flavius wanted to attack the emperor while he was singing on the stage. Just talks about some things. So a different Flavius, right? Different individuals with different names. Very important um, not to get taken in that, right? Such as Flavius, this one, right? Different individuals, right? Very important. Similar, closely similar names, but you got to note that basically the individuals that was involved in this conspiracy were slaves. A lot of them were slayed. And it was a conspiracy just basically to become a ruler, get on the throne, right? A lot of people were executed. It says, here's the aftermath, right? There were at least 41 people in a conspiracy. It says 19 were either executed or forced to commit suicide. 17 others were um, basically exiled or basically um, you know, lost their position. And five were acquitted. Just talks about basically they were released, you know? And then obviously the conspiracy, it ended. You know, it was it's one of those things that came... It came and it went. Another emperor came and most likely more conspiracies happened happen against him to kill him, to try to kill him, as those things are a common thing with Rome. So family tree, get an understanding. Ben Spazen, by the time of Ben Spazen, the, the peso, all that peso idea was gone by the time of Ben Spazen. By when, when Ben Spazen was there, especially Domitian, by the time of Ben Spazen and Domitian, who were persecuting Christians, they were persecuting Christians. Remember that. That whole thing was done. That whole idea was done already, right? And remember, Nero was already persecuting Christians, right? Very important. So the Flavian dynasty was one of those, a different dynasty, a short-lived dynasty, right? Very short-lived, very, very short. But it was a dynasty separate from that dynasty, right? We've seen that the people had um, fought and they basically... Uh, went at it, right? And remember, we talked about this individual. We talked about him, right? We talked about he was killed too by Vince Spazen, and he had a half-brother there, right? Peso, right? We talked about how his family tree and how he's connected and everything. He was killed too. That's very important. He died. He died early. By the time of the individual, all the family of the Peso family died. That's very important. So long story short, you know, I wish I could have ended it with something more um, fancy, maybe something a little more than that. But I guess the best way to put that is that basically the Piso family died. So for them to even try to spread something, it wouldn't make any sense. It's just one of those families that came to an abrupt end because of conspiracies and things that they had did. So just to get an understanding on these things, that's what happened. So with, the, with, the, with that, I guess that's the best way to summarize it. It's just a conspiracy that got blown out of out of the water and all the conspirators were dealt with. A lot of them were dealt with and there was no one to do anything extra. It was just one, that's how simple it was. It's just that simple, you know? So I guess with that, you know, maybe one day we'll go into um, this a little more in detail just to talk about why, you know, how did it get to the point of being blown out of the water how did it get to the hands of others to where they confused the historicity and made it something more than what it is? It's a plain, born conspiracy. And it was just something that others made into something. And you can see they'll take this person's name because his name is Flavius and then try to connect all these weird things that don't connect, that just don't connect, things that don't connect. So I guess just to make it clear, to understand these things, don't mix up names. For example, here's an here's example of a name mix up. 
um, let me just show it for example here. So don't mix names up. Don't mix names up. Just because someone has the same similar name, don't mix the name up. Here's an example. One of the early leaders of the revolt. I'm going to show you something here. The car. Get a little idea of the name mixing. It's starting to pop up here and there, and it makes a lot of sense to me. So I want to go ahead and bring it up to you. Now it says here Eliezer. Eliezer B. Ananias. Eliezer, huh? Eliezer. Eliezer. Equally odd is Joseph's silence as to the fate of Eliezer. How come Joseph is rarely mentioned this guy, right? So obviously he it says oddly is is Josephus silence on the fate. The ending is his fate. It's saying Josephus doesn't know the ending of Eliezer, but we do. Eliezer, we already went through it. He converted to Christianity, right? And he were he was persecuted to death because he converted to Christianity, right? He was converted by one of the disciples of Messiah named Jacob, right? And Eliezer obviously was killed, right? Being a Christian. We already talked about that. Obviously, that's why Josephus didn't know because he didn't know he converted and he didn't know what happened afterwards when he left. So that's very important. But that's important to know. No, we already talked about that. Eliezer, he, I'm not going to go over it, but he confuses Eliezer from the revolt with Anna, with um, Antiochus Epiphanes from 167 AD with the Eliezer from 65 AD, the one that converted to Christianity. So very important to note these um, different individuals. These names, don't mix up names. Get these things right or else you're going to make something that's going to just you know, at the end of the story, it's just going to be like, well, no, you know, it's just no, you know, the best, I could have just started no, this, the, the video and said, are these, these individuals? No, but I want to show you with all the historicity, you can follow it to its root and get deeper into it and know that these individuals died. A lot of individuals in the Peso family because of that conspiracy died um, in the connection and the connection with the people that they're connected to. Um, they died. Uh, a lot of people, even by the time of Inspazin, he killed people. He killed a lot of them. He slayed a lot of them. It was a, a, a line that was wiped out. And obviously, they, their cells were trying to basically declare a place, and that didn't work out for them. That just didn't work out. So I guess with that, that's all I got for you, family. With that, be blessed. I don't know if you got any questions, but be beloved. And we'll be back, y'all willing, tomorrow. Maybe just on some, just a calm day, just calm questions. With that, be blessed, be beloved, and amen.